Thank you, everybody. I declare open this hearing of the Senate Select Committee on COVID-19. Today's public hearing will focus on vaccinations, but will also cover other matters under the terms of reference. Information on the procedural rules governing public hearings has been provided to all witnesses and is available from the Secretariat. If a witness objects to answering a question, the witness should explain the basis for the objection in sufficient detail to allow the committee to determine whether to accept the objection. The, the committee will then decide whether to insist on an answer. Witnesses may request that answers be given confidentially. I remind those on video conference to mute their microphones when they're not speaking, and witnesses appearing via teleconference should state their name every time they speak. Please also ensure mobile phones are switched off or turned to silent. Can I start by asking, we have representatives here from um, the Department of Health, uh, the TGA, ATAGI, and General Fruin as well from Operation COVID Shield. Uh, can I ask all of you, those sort of four different categories, whether they, any of you have an opening statement you'd like to give? Senator General Fruin has an opening statement, but that was the only one we have. Okay, and yeah. Professor Skerritt or um, Professor Cheng? No, I have no opening statement. Okay. For me, uh, just letting you know, um, um, Chris Blythe is uh, trying to join, but is having difficulties. Okay. Um, we, he keeps getting blocked. Okay, we might just, um, we'll, we'll get someone onto that to make sure we can assist. Okay. Thank you, Professor Cheng. Okay, over to you, General Fruin. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the opportunity to make a short opening statement to the committee. Uh, we've now passed 27 million doses administered in Australia. Over 76% of people aged over 16 have received their first vaccination, and now over 52% have received their second dose. Uh, over 94% of 70-year-olds, over 91% of over 60-year-olds, and 88% of over 50-year-olds have received their first doses. And we're now delivering around 2 million doses a week, and we continue to achieve record days and weeks in our vaccine program. On the 23rd of September uh, this year, 347,796 doses were delivered, a record day for our program and faster on a per capita basis than any day in the United Kingdom, France or Italy's rollouts. 99% of aged care workers have now received the first vaccination dose. This is one of the highest workforce vaccination rates in the world and is contributing directly to the safety and confidence within all of Australia's residential aged care facilities. Over 90% of aged care residents have had their first dose and over 86% have had a second dose. Across the disability sector, 73.9% of NDIS screen workers are vaccinated with a first dose and 59.3% with a second. 75.2% of NDIS participants in shared accommodation have been vaccinated with a first dose and 66.7% with a second. 45.9% of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians have been vaccinated with the first dose and 29.1% with the second dose. The Commonwealth, State and Territory Health Departments and community representatives have jointly identified and commenced acceleration activities in 30 priority areas to increase vaccination rates of Indigenous Australians. Several acceleration activities are already underway in priority areas. These include providing additional Pfizer doses, increased funding for vaccine staff, dedicated Aboriginal family days, and Royal Flying Doctor Service targeted deployments. On Friday, I released updated national allocations, which outline doses that will be delivered in October and projected allocations for November and December. This confirms that 15.7 million doses will be received in October, including 12.7 million doses of mRNA vaccines. We're now entering a phase of the rollout where anyone who is willing to step forward can step forward and access a vaccine. By the end of the month, people will be able to receive either the Pfizer or Moderna vaccines from more than 8,000 primary care vaccination sites. A rapid rollout of Moderna to community pharmacies across Australia has commenced with 1,825 pharmacies receiving some 442,900 doses to commence vaccinating from the week of 20 September and a further 1,279 making orders to receive a further 242,200 doses in the week of 27 September. Thank you again for the opportunity to make this opening statement and I welcome any questions. Uh, thank you very much, General Fruin. I have no doubt you, there will be lots of questions uh, for you over the course of the day. Um, colleagues, we have just circulated that opening statement on email for you to refer back to. Uh, just before I hand to um, senators to kick off the questioning, I've just got a couple of 
uh, house sort of housekeeping matters. Um, one, Dr. Murphy, you wrote in response to me around uh, my request to get access to the uh, modelling and analysis that you were doing for National Cabinet on hospital preparedness um, and um, I've those, um, I think with the agreement of the committee, those letters, both my letter and your letter, um, should be published, if that's okay. Um, now, your response to me says that you won't provide that information to the committee because deliberations of National Cab... The, the Australian Government maintains the view that deliberations of National Cabinet should remain confidential. This includes information received by the National Cabinet, and this is consistent with long-standing practice on confidentiality. Um, I guess my first question is, um, you know, have, you, have you referred that matter off to the Minister for a formal PII claim, or is that, has, has the Minister instructed you to write that response to my letter? Um, that, I guess that's my first question. Uh, no, Senator, we, have, we haven't yet referred it off to a PII claim. We will uh, take that on notice to do so. But uh, as I, I think said in the letter, both the National Cabinet generally and the government still maintain National Cabinet documents uh, remain cabinet in confidence. Yes, I, I'm aware of, of um, that and the position. They have some legislation to deal with um, that matter in the Senate. But I guess from my procedural point of view, um, you know, the Senate has not accepted that just because something is claimed to be cabinet in conference that it should be withheld from the committee. Um, I would argue that this is a very important piece of information in terms of the opening up of Australians that we are expected to in the next couple of months and understanding hospital capacity is critical uh, to understanding how that opening up will impact on all of us who have been doing the right thing and, and um, living through lockdowns. But the pr correct process, if you are not going to provide it to the committee, is to refer it to the minister for a formal PII claim. The committee can't allow a letter just saying you're not going to get it. In short, that's what I'm saying. Thank you, Senator. We will refer to the minister for a formal PII claim, but I should point out that National Cabinet has uh, generally taken the view that once uh, material has been approved for National Cabinet, they've taken a view about publicly releasing. They've released a lot of the previous Doherty modelling, and I, I would be uh, reasonably confident that the National Cabinet may wish to release some of the uh, modelling in, in coming weeks once it's been finalised. Mm. Notwithstanding that, the, the information is available now. I mean, from my understanding of media reports, you have provided presentations, you've provided that analysis to National Cabinet, and that's the information we're seeking. But I accept that you have referred it off. We will no mm -hmm. doubt have questions uh, around that. The second um, issue is uh, the questions on notice. Um, and I again note that you have had a lot of questions on notice. In your letter, you say 677, um, and that there are um, around uh, over 80 outstanding. Some of those are nearly three months overdue. The committee is working to a 10-day timeframe. We are trying to you know, provide transparency and accountability in reasonable time. Our job is made harder if departments take three months to answer questions that were asked in July. Again, it's a, it's a plea, and I understand you are, have a heavy workload. I'm not disputing that. Um, the third issue is uh, the Disability Royal Commission draft report. Yesterday there was some discussion around um, additional witnesses appearing at today's hearing, Services Australia and the NDIA. Uh, the view I've taken as chair is that um, we will have another hearing on the Disability Royal Commission or aspects raised by that report. For today's purposes, though, could I ask colleagues asking questions to confine any questions you have about that report to matters that the Department of Health are responsible for? Um, I think that's a reasonable request. We shouldn't go into areas which DSS and the NDIA are responsible for. So I'll just preface um, that. Um, at the beginning of the hearing. Can I now hand the call to Senator Keneally to kick this, things off? And could other senators indicate to me on the WhatsApp group um, witnesses they have questions for, um, and I will try and allocate fairly. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you to the Department of Health uh, for being here today. And my questions in this lot of questioning will be directed to the department as opposed to General Fruin. 
I do want to go to the Disability Royal Commission's draft report released yesterday, which found that the Department of Health, and I quote, failed to meet the challenges of rolling out the COVID-19 vaccine to people with a disability in important respects, uh, especially to people living in residential disability settings and disability support workers. The Royal Commission found that the Department of Health's rollout was, quote, seriously deficient. In particular, the Disability Royal Commission made uh, findings that the Department of Health made a critical decision in early March 2021 to give priority in the vaccine rollout to aged care residents over all people in residential disability settings, and that that decision, a crucial decision, was made without consulting the disability sector and was not made public until the department gave evidence to this committee uh, six weeks after the decision was taken. It seems to me that you told people with a disability that they were a priority for vaccination. Then you changed your mind and decided they were not, but for six weeks didn't tell them they were no longer a priority. And if Senator Gallagher had not asked the questions in front of this committee, it's not clear if that information would have ever come to light. Can I ask you your response to finding nine of the draft report that the department quote, misled, quote, people with a disability into believing they were going to continue to receive priority administration of the vaccination in accordance with phase 1A. What is your response to the finding that you misled people with a disability when it came to the vaccine rollout? Thank you, Senator uh, Brendan Murphy, Secretary, Department of Health. Uh, we can't specifically comment on a draft report that hasn't been received by government. It's been published uh, uh, and it's there for fact-checking. Uh, there has been no uh, report received by the Governor-General and we are not in a position to make a formal response. But I'm very happy to go to the general contention uh, that, about the disability rollout because we've made various submissions to the, to the hearing and post the hearing. I think at the outset it's very important to note that Australia's experience with the disability through COVID has been an excellent one. We've had a, a lower rate of infections compared to the general community. And whilst there have been a small number of tragic deaths, a lower death rate than, than the general community. The disability community were prioritised in, in both groups 1A and group 1B. And they have remained a priority throughout the rollout. It is, it is true that the groups in 1A, uh, for one, in respect of one of the many av avenues of vaccination, and I should point out that there are many avenues of vaccination for people in residential disability. They have had access to state clinics, they've had access to primary care when it's come on, they've had the first access to every source of vaccination. But it is true that the uh, in the very early days, we, we did not uh, stop providing in-reach services to residential disability, but we did give a greater priority to residential aged care when the complexity of the aged care rollout was appreciated. And that has probably saved over a thousand lives in aged care because all of our advice was that that was the single highest risk population, but we did not deprioritise disability residents. They remained a priority the whole way through uh, the program and we have had very extensive communication with the disability committee. We've had an active advisory committee that has been meeting throughout the pandemic and has been briefed on the vaccine rollout at every stage. So it has been, it is obviously a very complex uh, task of vaccinating the disability community but they have, rem they have remained and do remain a priority and at the moment uh, General Fruin I'm sure can later talk about the very significant scale up we are doing now, but it is important to note that residential disability residents now have a higher rate of full vaccination than the general community are getting very close to our targets and disability workers have a higher rate of vaccination than the general population. Uh, thank you for that answer. Uh, however, uh, let's go to one part of it. You said you have uh, been uh, consulting with the advisory committee the whole way through. The first 
finding of the Disability Royal Commission's draft report is the Australian Government Department of Health neither genuinely consulted nor sought advice from the Advisory Committee on Health Emergency Response to Coronavirus for people with a disability or disability representative organizations. That is a pretty flat statement that directly contradicts your contention that you have been consulting with the advisory committee. Now, right. you may not want to provide a formal response to a draft report, but that is a significant criticism this committee needs to take on board. Do you accept that what you consider genuine consultation has not been considered genuine consultation by people with a disability or their representative organisations. Senator, I would contend that we have had active and genuine consultation. There will always be some people who feel that it didn't meet their needs, but I'm very happy to get the officials who chaired those meetings and have been meeting almost weekly in recent times uh, to talk about the consultation that right through the vaccine rollout, this committee has had a briefing from the vaccine task force. They've had engagement in the vaccine rollout. They've had engagement in the prioritisation. So I believe our consultation has been genuine uh, and the whole way through, as I said, there, are, there might always be some people who feel that it could have been improved and we will always acknowledge that uh, we can always do things better. And when we do get a report from the Royal Commission, we will obviously study it in great detail and see if there are any lessons to be learned from it. Yeah, it's not just some people though, is it? It is actually from the Disability Royal Commission. I look forward to you studying it in detail. Let me go to their um, Department of Health's decision in the first week of March 2021 to prioritise aged care residents in the rollout of the vaccine. The, the draft report says that this had the effect as the department appreciated of halting the administration of vaccines to people in residential disability accommodation, even though they were in phase 1A of the rollout strategy. It is accurate to describe the decision, the draft report says, as one that deprioritized the vaccination of people in residential disability accommodation. Why weren't people told of that deprioritization? Why did it, was it kept back from them for six weeks and only revealed when Senator Gallagher asked a question in this committee? Senator, again, I'm not going to respond to the Royal Commission draft report, but I will say that we don't believe that residential disability residents were deprioritised. They remained in Priority 1A. They continued to have access to both in-reach services, GP services uh, when, when they came online and state clinics. There was a shift in the focus to residential aged care, but that was, and that did increase the pace of residential aged care vaccinations. Um, and certainly the rate of residential disability vaccinations was significantly slower at that time because of the clear need to get the residential aged care population vaccinated to save the lives that we have done. But, we don't accept that it was a deprioritisation. They remained a priority in 1A. Uh, the, the draft report does say that it was, in quote, entirely reasonable for the Australian Government Department of Health to take into account advice that aged care residents were particularly at risk. But the report goes on to say the department should have also considered the position of people in residential disability settings facing similar risks of serious illness or death from contracting the virus. It would have enabled the department to determine if it could identify these people and reach them to offer the vaccine. It is quite clear from the evidence before the Disability Royal Commission that people with a disability and their representative organizations do not, do not accept that efforts were made to one, consider the risk that they faced, and two, to find ways to reach them to offer the vaccine. My question to you, again, is why didn't you communicate the prioritization of aged care residents over disability residents? And what were, and did you, what was the, what were the factors that you considered in making the decision to prioritize aged care residents over disability residents. And then my third question will go to, um, essentially, why wasn't it possible to walk and chew gum at the same time? 
why did we have to choose between aid care residents and disability care, uh, disability residents? Was it a lack of supply that meant you weren't able to offer the vaccine to both groups with the same priority? Thank you, Senator. On, the, on that last question, supply has never been a constraint in these groups. The actual volume of vaccines required for disability residents is actually quite small in number. We had plentiful supply. The reason why we focused, we did not stop doing residential in reach disability, but we did focus most of the efforts of our contracted in reach providers on residential aged care on the clear medical advice that these were a significantly higher risk. And because once the in reach program started, it, and we've, I think, discussed this many times at previous meetings of this committee, it proved to be very much more complicated for these in-reach providers to complete a facility, be it disability or aged care. The consent processes, there were lots of issues with families wanting consent and the time taken to complete a facility uh, was much, much longer than had initially been planned. And so the program did have to uh, focus most of the growth in activity in the aged care sector because we knew that we had to get that sector finished uh, before winter to save lives. And that was why that, that those decisions were made. But it was, as I said, not a removal of the priority for residential disability. They remained in 1A and continued to have access to vaccines. You've said that several times. That is uh, clearly uh, not the finding of this draft report, Ms. Edwards said on 20 April that, to the committee that they were quote, re ready to ramp up quote, vaccinations to people with a disability from that point, but only just over 1,000 people had been vaccinated by mid-April. Truly, were they ever prioritized? The evidence to this committee and the facts of the rollouts <coughs> were not. You've just told us uh, that uh, it was a far more complex set of situations, that it was not because of supply. I'm again put to you that there was a deprioritization uh, of people with a disability in residential aid, in residential facilities, uh, and that that was not communicated to them. Do you so, reject that? No, I, I, I have acknowledged that we focused the that particular group of in-reach providers, the contracted providers, the Aspens, HCOs, and Sonic, we focused them because they had a limited capacity, limited workforce. We definitely focused them on residential aged care as, as uh, their major area of focus until that residential aged care was completed because there was a strong priority to complete them by winter. But we continued to provide access to residential disability uh, but not at the same rate as aged care, and we have acknowledged that. So how were the risk profiles between aged care and disability settings weighed against each other? What was the process? The process, sure, sure the, we, you might wish to direct that question to the chairs of ATAGI because we have always taken our priority decisions on the basis of advice from ATAGI who and their, their advice, and just to summarise, that there is no doubt whatsoever that the single highest risk for severe COVID is age. Uh, nearly all of the major deaths have occurred in older people, and we saw that in the Victorian second wave last year. And fortunately, we have not seen it in aged care in the New South Wales outbreak, even though it's much bigger this year because we protected those residents. So age has, is, residential aged care is the single highest risk setting. Every experience of every country around the world has shown that. Atagi may choose to answer that question if you would like to address it to them, Senator. But back to my point is, back to my question, why wasn't that communicated to people in residential uh, disability settings. They were told they were in phase 1A. There was clearly a decision taken based on advice of a TAGI, based on your own determination, it's not entirely clear, that to prioritise aged care. Why weren't people in resident, why weren't people within residential disability settings told that they were in fact being deprioritised within phase 1A? Well, as I said, Senator, I don't accept that they were deprioritised. I think it, what they, 
the discussions at that disability advisory committee with the vaccine team at the time, uh, in hindsight, could have told them that there was a stronger focus on residential aged care, and they didn't. And I think Ms. Edwards acknowledged that. Um, but they were, we don't contend that they would be prioritised. Oh, Chair, I have two more questions. I'm not sure about mine. Uh, we may want to return to this. Yeah. But my, I want to go to two other issues raised by the draft report. Uh, one, uh, one of the findings is that the Australian Government Department of Health, quote, used the critical first four weeks of the vaccine rollout to acquire poor learning to understand the challenges facing the rollout to the priority disability group. The report then goes on to say that the department lost an opportunity in those four weeks to make significant progress on vaccinating people. That is, the report seems to find you spent the first critical four weeks learning rather than vaccinating. And the report does make a finding that some of this learning could have been done prior to the vaccine rollout. Do you accept that finding from the draft report? Senator, as I've said uh, previously, we are not going to be able to comment to findings in the draft report. They're draft findings we have not been for, for formally given uh, a report from the Commission. But I will say on the, on the general contention that this was uh, a completely new and com complex rollout that nobody had ever done anything of this nature in the, in the past. In those, in those first few weeks, the practical experience on the ground of going into disability facilities and aged care facilities, there certainly were learnings that were going to, as I've said already, the complexity of the consent process and getting uh, dealing with those vaccines with their cold chain things, even though there'd been lots of planning and lots of studying uh, and lots of uh, uh, modelling done, the complexity was 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 made more apparent at the practical rollout. So, but in those first few weeks, there were lots of people vaccinated. Mm. Okay. Uh, one last question, yeah. Jeff, if I can. How does the Department of Health respond to concerns raised in the report and indeed a recommendation that it would be, quote, unconscionable to lift lockdowns before all Australians with a disability can be vaccinated? Uh, Senator, again, not wanting to comment on the report, but our, our intention is that uh, every Australian will have had a, a genuine opportunity to be vaccinated uh, by the time we, we reach those 70% fully vaccinated targets. And uh, as General Fruin uh, uh, can indicate, we are making extremely good progress with, uh, but residents with disability is well ahead of the general population and the general NDIS community, which is one of the most complex groups to vaccinate, is, uh, is the single highest priority along with Indigenous Australians from the back Operation COVID Shield at the moment, and there is a very significant action. We are very confident that the disability uh, population will be full, fully vaccinated in, in similar uh, to, uh, to the general population targets, and will certainly will have had a genuine opportunity to be vaccinated by the time we reach those targets. So I'm happy to ask, get General Fruin to, to give you some indication of the approach to the disability community, if you would like. I do have questions later for General Fruin. Okay. Um, so, Senator Keneally, I might yep. just um, hand the call now to Senator Patterson. And could I just ask other senators, if you are on the in the hearing, could you let me know on the WhatsApp group if you have questions? Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'm going to try and cover a range of issues in the time I have this morning. I'll see how we go. I want to come back to disability vaccination in a moment, but first, um, I guess in breaking news, that it's been revealed this morning that there were 149 missing cases from Victoria's daily case tally yesterday, and instead of being 705, it should have been 845, uh, which was would mean that it was the first time that in raw numbers Victoria has passed New South Wales in the current outbreak uh, for the largest number of cases. And of course, Victoria had already passed New South Wales uh, in per capita terms on Saturday, given the, the smaller population. Um, to either uh, Professor Murphy or Professor Kelly, I guess that puts the final nail in the coffin of that 
um, zero COVID ideology that if you lock down hard and fast and early that you can somehow control a Delta outbreak. Victoria couldn't have locked down any harder or any earlier in this outbreak and yet here we are with more cases than New South Wales. Professor Kelly, would you like to answer that? Um, <clears throat> thank you, Secretary. Thank you for your question, Senator. Uh, Professor Paul Kelly, Chief Medical Officer for the Department of Health. Um, so uh, we are, as, as you've pointed out, Senator, in a, in a situation of, uh, of uh, ongoing local transmission of the virus of this new Delta variant in New South Wales and Victoria and ACT at the moment. Um, those three jurisdictions have had quite different approaches, as you've pointed out, uh, in terms of the hard, hardness and fastness of lockdowns. Uh, in the end, they've, they've generally ended up in the same sort of place um, in terms of quite harsh lockdowns. Um, cases are, uh, have, have, are continuing to rise in Victoria. Uh, they are, I, I believe, on a downward um, trajectory in New South Wales uh, and have been pretty flat in the ACT all throughout that period. We are seeing that the, this Delta variant is much more transmissible uh, in the community. Uh, we're seeing uh, quite a different out, uh, outbreak in two very key ways from last, last year's experience, particularly in Victoria. The first of those is that we're seeing more cases in children. Um, and the second uh, is that uh, we are seeing far less deaths than we did last year. Um, the main reason for both of those is, in fact, the vaccine rollout, uh, which has been extraordinarily successful in decreasing um, uh, death rates, in particular in those most vulnerable people. And Professor uh, Dr Murphy's already mentioned uh, those, particularly in, in aged care. That has been a spectacularly um, successful operation. I'm sure uh, uh, General Fruin will talk further about that later. Um, so we are still seeing those, those cases. Um, it, it is extremely difficult to control this virus. Uh, it's a combination and will continue to be a combination even as we go higher in the vaccination rollout uh, with uh, test, trace and isolate and quarantine procedures that we've honed uh, over the last 12 months and public health and social measures. The need for those very strict lockdowns, however, will decrease and they will decrease very soon. Mm. Yeah, and I guess um, looking at those New South Wales figures and the case numbers appearing to be on a downward trajectory now, that's very encouraging for Victorians because hopefully that's uh, around the corner for us because New South Wales obviously has a higher rate of vaccination than Victoria, but also um, much less strict restrictions than Victoria has right now comparatively and their cases are going down while ours are still going up. Um, how has New South Wales tracked uh, against your expectations for cases based on that increasing vaccination rate? So uh, the, the, the committee will recall some, uh, with, with, when we're in, uh, General Fruer may wish to, to talk through through some of the, uh, the, the um, events of the past couple of months in terms of extra vaccines uh, arriving from overseas. And we did, there was a decision, it was my uh, advice to, uh, to the program and to the Prime Minister about um, uh, uh, pushing, uh, some of those first tranche of the, of the vaccines we received from Poland into those high risk, high, um, high areas of transmission areas of Southwest and Western Sydney. Uh, and that has absolutely borne fruit. Um, that, that decision has been very much vindicated. We've seen um, through these past uh, month or six weeks, uh, a, a quite rapid decrease in the cases in some of the most Hard affected uh, LGAs in southwest and western Sydney, um, and, and and that I am absolutely certain is due to the decision made to put vaccine in there and specifically to address the issue of transmission in the in young adults. Uh, so that was the next phase of the of the of the rollout of the vaccine. Um, that is a, that is absolutely allowed as as we've seen from the from the modelling that uh, we've had, uh, as well as other other modellers have suggested. Um, that as vaccine rates go up, um, you can start to titrate some of those public health and social measures such as strict lockdowns uh, and get the same effect. In fact, the, the, uh, the report we get uh, every week and is, and is, is pub public, um, publicly available from, uh, in terms of transmission potential and, and are effective, uh, is now starting to show for the first time over the last month or so 
a, the the true effect of the of the vaccination rollout, and that mm. has has by far been most felt uh, in a positive way in New South Wales. Mm. And and the other component of that is, uh, of course, ICU admission, which appears in New South Wales to be lower than some of the modelling indicated. I know the Bernard Institute, for example, was. Um, forecasting much higher rates of ICU admission in New South Wales. Um, does that is that something a trend you expect to hold and and be replicated across the country as those higher rates of vaccination are achieved in other states? Uh, yes, I do, Senator Patterson. I, uh, that's that's certainly we know from from the beginning of the uh, of the uh, development of the of the vaccines, both the mRNA uh, vaccines of which we have now two, and the um, AstraZeneca that the they have a, a very large and lasting effect on decreasing severity of illness. Uh, and so we know that um, the, the issues we're seeing in all three states, uh, two states and a territory that are having out, uh, ongoing outbreaks, um, this is very much a, uh, a, an epidemic of the unvaccinated. Um, uh, and that those, so, so cases themselves, uh, admissions to hospital in particular, ICU rates, and deaths are all lower in uh, in those that are vaccinated. I can illustrate that with some actual figures, as uh, up to and including uh, yesterday. Um, uh, and and I'll, I'll 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 point out by age group. So again, just uh, as we've said before, that that older age group, um, uh, so 70 to 79 years, um, uh, there was four four percent of the of the total cases were vaccinated. Um, uh, only only three percent of those that are in ICU are vaccinated. In the younger age groups, in the 16 to 69 age group, there was no one in intensive care uh, that was fully vaccinated. Um, and so the, these are really important elements to consider. Not only is it is the vaccine uh, effective, at least in part, to stopping transmission between people, but most importantly, it does slow down and decrease those cases of severe illness. Uh, so I, I agree with what you've said there, Senator, that um, whilst the initial modelling for New South Wales, which was based on their trajectory of vaccination at the time, uh, suggested that they would have a peak of ICU and hospitalisation admissions um, in late October, that, that uh, rise has been halted uh, and it's in fact decreasing now. Uh, there is always a gap between cases and, uh, and those severe illnesses. So, so we wouldn't count our chickens before they're completely hatched, but at the moment it certainly looks very uh, positive that, that the peak of both cases and severe illness has been reached in New South Wales. Now, they are starting to, to loosen some of the public health and social measures uh, as they uh, get to that 70% um, total vaccination rate. We'll just have to see what that shows, but um, of course we're monitoring that very closely. Thank you. Um, there was a report in The Australian today that said that Victoria will have uh, a sufficient uh, supply of mRNA vaccine doses for 100% of Victorians aged uh, 12 and above to be vaccinated by the end of October, and then there will be 500,000 spare. Um, can, first of all, is that, can you confirm that that reporting is accurate? I'll get General Fruin to respond to that, but we are no longer supply constrained, General. Yeah. So, um, Senator, we're just at a point in the program now where we believe we're shifting from what has been a supply constrained model to a demand constrained model. Uh, with the forecasts of mRNA vaccines, both Pfizer and Moderna, that we anticipate both through October and then into November, um, we think that. No longer will it be the sort of supply-based rationing of mRNA vaccines that we've had to do up until now. Uh, it really will be about there being um, uh, adequate distribution points, adequate mRNA vaccines, uh, still AstraZeneca available. Um, and really, as we start to progress towards those 70% fully vaccinated, 80% fully vaccinated rates, um, it's all going to be about making sure people continue to come forward. Um, if people do continue to come forward, then potentially, you know, we can progress through 80% and beyond. Um, but it, it really is now about public willingness to uh, to get vaccinated. 
But it, but just want to understand that those figures are right. Um, 549,753 mRNA dose surplus if every Victorian aged 12 and over is vaccinated and a surplus of a bit more than 1 million if only those 16 and over to, were to be considered. Is that accurate? Uh, look, I need to take those numbers on notice, Senator, to sure. give a proper response here. OK, well, the purpose of my question is what I'm trying to understand is if that is the case, if we're now moving into an environment where we're no longer supply constrained, why do states like Victoria continue to persist with a six-week dose gap for Pfizer rather than a three-week dose gap as recommended uh, by a target? Uh, Senator, I think that that's a decision for the states uh, to, to make. Uh, a target has made a broad range of recommendations uh, uh, at minimum of three weeks when, and they can go longer. So there's no particular reason. I think it's a programmatic decision for, for different states have made it in, in different contexts. So mm. uh, I appreciate it. it's not your decision, uh, Professor Murphy, but I'm just trying to understand it because it doesn't make a lot of sense to me to delay people being fully protected when they have the opportunity and clearly now the supply is there. It seems like if there ever was a time when Victoria needed to ration and spread out the doses, that, that that's clearly no longer the case. It would appear on the supply projections we've got now that there should be sufficient to bring that forward, and I'm sure they're considering that at the moment. I don't know whether General Froome wants to comment on these discussions with Victoria. No, the, um, look, the various jurisdictions have applied different dosing parameters depending on where they are in both the rollout and where they are in terms of hotspots. There has been prioritisation of first doses. There has been uh, both extensions and contractions within dosings across the jurisdictions progressively. And I think the states and territories are adjusting those um, as they go. Because mm. there's, a, there's a great chart produced um, by the ABC, a case of Briggs from the ABC, or that tracks the um, time between doses by state and territory. And it shows that Victoria has the largest gap between doses. I think 42 days was the latest, and some states have as low as 32 days. Um, that's quite material in terms of when we're going to hit those 70 to 80 percent double dose targets and when we're going to be able to uh, have a significant amount of freedoms returned to us. Um, so it just, it just seems inexplicable to me why Victoria is out on its own with such a a large gap between its doses. I'm sure they'll be re they'll be reviewing their program uh, with the new supply, uh, but I think I think I think what the point that uh, you're making is that supply is is progress is increasingly no longer uh, a constraint in terms of programmatic decisions. So we have good supplies now. Right. Well, that's very positive. Um, just finally from me, Chair, I just want to come back to this issue of um, people with disabilities and their uh, rates of vaccination. H how do the rates of vaccination of people with disabilities compare to the population uh, at large? General Fruin, do you want to answer that? What was the question? Disability, how do they compare? The disability residence rates, which I mentioned in my opening statement, Senator, uh, presently for the residents in facilities are at 75.2% first dose and 66.7% fully vaccinated. And for the disability workers, uh, these are registered workers, vetted workers, they're at 73.9% first dose and 59.3% fully vaccinated. And both of those fully vaccinated rates are ahead of the national average. Right, thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Thanks very much, Senator Patterson. Senator Lambie, can I just check and see if you are there, and if you have questions. Yes. OK, we might come back to you, Senator Lambie. I'll, um, I'll have some questions in the meantime. Can I ask some questions to um, Professor Cheng and, and Professor Blythe? You've, um, there's an article in the uh, paper today which has comments, I think, from, uh, certainly from you, uh, Professor Blythe, around your advice and how that advice, well, the quote in the article in the headline is misconstrued by the Prime Minister. Just wondering if there are, you know, um, whether you would like to provide some evidence to the committee about that. I think the quote from you is, when your advice is questioned, you question your role. Is there information you can provide the committee about what happened during that period of time when ATAGI was making recommendations and then further decisions were taken? 
Sure, I'm happy to uh, answer that. And so, Chris Blythe, uh, 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 co chair of ATAGI. Um, so, a lot of this is in the public space. Our advice provided on the 8th of April was to rec have a preferential recommendation for uh, Pfizer for younger people. Um, now, clearly, that has significant impact on the program, and we appreciate that. Um, so, I, I suppose what I'm talking about in that, that quote is really how the program was shaped on the back of that advice. Okay. So, um, in terms of the mechanics of how that worked, and so I understand it. Atagi um, considers the, uh, all the evidence, um, makes um, or provides advice. That advice goes to who? Does it go to the health minister? Does it go back to the Department of Health? How, what are the actual steps for that advice to reach the Prime Minister? So, as per our terms of reference, we directly report to the Minister. Um, so, advice provided by ATAGI is provided to the Department of Health that is then provided to the Minister. Um, our, my expectation is the Prime Minister is brought in by the Minister of Health, but our, our reporting lines are to the Minister. Okay. So, during... Have you um, met with the Prime Minister during this time, particularly during April to July? this year. Did you have the opportunity to meet with him, to brief him on the ATAGI advice? Have I personally met with the Prime Minister during this time? No, I have not. Right. Has anyone from ATAGI? I, um, uh, it's Alan Chang, um, co-chair of ATAGI for COVID. Um, I appeared at uh, National Cabinet and obviously the Prime Minister was present there. Okay. But, uh, Professor Cheng, not like for, for yeah. advice where you've, you've, ATAGI's made advice, it's gone to the Department of Health. Has have you then met with the Prime Minister based on that advice, like for further information or questions? Not, not outside of National Cabinet, no. That was the only time I've met the Prime Minister. OK. Um, do you meet with the Minister for Health? We have met with the Minister for Health throughout this process. I can't give those dates, but we have had direct communication with the Minister for Health and the Minister has attended ATAGI meetings um, I can't remember the number of occasions, but has attended during this uh, last six months. Okay. Okay. And did you meet with him following the decision or the advice given around um, prioritisation of Pfizer for certain age groups specifically? No. So, um, bef so before April and before June, as the sort of important um, yeah. days where the advice was changed, um, uh, he, he attended. I'm just trying to think. He attended one meeting of ATAGI, but really it was just in general terms to express his support, and not um, there wasn't like a in-depth discussion about the um, advice that we were providing. Um, or and obviously, he didn't seek to. Um, to influence that decision in any way. Um, so yeah, the okay. meetings that we've had with the Minister are really in general terms. And um, Okay. So that meeting where he was to express his support, was that, um, do you know if that, was that before July? I will have to uh, um, check. I, I don't, can't remember the date. I suspect it was between April and July, but I can't remember okay. that for sure. And why would he come and, and give you an expression of support? What was the purpose oh, of that? He, oh, I think it was, uh, I read it as an expression of appreciation, but okay. Um, yeah, okay. I, nothing. Okay, so when, um, so the, I think on both, um, in both April and June, when there was a change to the program, the vaccine rollout based on ATAGI advice, were you aware that there were going to be um, were you advised that there was going to be a change to the program from the, the government in terms of allocation for AstraZeneca and Pfizer? Do you get that information back to ATAGI? I, I can answer that, Senator. Um, yeah. So we provide advice ahead of any change to the program. We are uh, independent of government. Um, we are asked for our uh, opinion on technical matters and we provide that to government. We know that with the 
expectation that that has the potential to shape the program um, as, as it has. Um, but um, are we necessarily bought in to the technical uh, to the mechanics of the shaping of the program? No, we're not. But you know, we're ahead of those decisions. Okay. So when there was press conferences held at night, and I think we've had evidence before this committee, particularly from um, Dr. Kelly, saying that you know there was a very short time between receiving the advice from Atagi and a press conference being called, would you be advised that that was going to be happening? Or was it a surprise to you when you turn on the TV and see um, a press conference changing the program like this? I can probably answer that. I mean, I think in our statements on um, the 8th of April, there is um, an acknowledgement that this would impact the program. Um, I think we were expecting that uh, the you know, our advice would be published and that may or may not be accompanied by, um, you know, a press conference um, and just, yeah, that timing is up to the government. But um, we, our role is to submit that advice and, um, uh, and that's what we did. Okay. Um, but you didn't have the opportunity uh, to brief the Prime Minister about your advice prior to that press conference being held? Uh, no, no. And to, okay. to be fair, I'm not sure that that would be um, would be usual in any case. Okay, so in July, when the Prime Minister, um, during a press conference, publicly criticised Atagi um, for the delays in the vaccine rollout, what is your response to that? I think we acknowledged in all of our statements that um, the advice that we provided would slow down the program. So um, I think that is uh, true to some extent, um, but um, uh, and but what we're trying to do is to roll out the program as quickly as possible. And um, we obviously are, were and are concerned about um, uh, some sort of opinion with uh, thrombosis syndrome or TTS. Um, and so th that was our advice. Um, at that time in that context about um, the safest way to roll out the program. Okay. Professor Blythe, you said in this article, I was shocked later in the year when Atagi was criticised for slowing the rollout. You also say, as someone not in the political space, the way our advice was misconstrued surprised me. Can you explain those comments? I can. I, yeah. I'm clearly not a politician. I'm a clinician who works as a technical expert for the Commonwealth Government. I was uh, shocked and surprised. Um, I suppose I was surprised um, that um, given the context that we we're in, um, that that uh, advice was uh, clearly levelled at Atagi. Um, I did not expect that. Okay. Did you raise concerns uh, about that with anybody? I'm not sure I formally raised concerns about that. I don't think there's something to be raised um, at that stage. Um, our job is to provide technical advice. I was very much aware mm. of that um, and uh, continue to do that and, and will continue to do that. But you had the Prime Minister blaming you, essentially, for the delays in the vaccine rollout. Um, you know, that's, it's a pretty big thing for a Prime Minister to come out on a doorstop and ba basically say it's the technical advisors uh, responsibility that we are where we are. I can imagine you would have been uh, shocked. Other member, were other members of ATAGI similarly concerned? Uh, members that I spoke to were taken aback by those comments um, because clearly it's much more complex than just an individual group of technical advisors. The program is a complex beast, as Professor Kelly and Professor Murphy have highlighted through this uh, sitting. Um, but uh, you know, uh, we need to stick to our swim lanes and continue to provide technical advice, and that's what we do. Mm. Um, <laughs> Have you had any, has there been any contact, contact from the Prime Minister back to Atagi since he made those comments? Like, has he apologised or? Um, I'm not sure we've received any formal correspondence, um, but I can, uh, I can check that. I don't recall any formal correspondence. Any informal? I don't recall any informal correspondence. Okay. Um, not that I'm aware of either. Sorry, Professor Cheng. Yeah, sorry, uh, not that I'm aware of either. 
Senator, I think I can just come in here and just say that I have expressed to Otagi that they retain at all times the full confidence of government. Uh, Minister Hunt has made that statement on many occasions. And the most important thing to note is that government on every occasion has accepted in full and acted upon the Otagi advice. Thank you, Professor Murphy. Then why did the Prime Minister blame them for the delays in the vaccine rollout, if that's the case? I think the Prime Minister was, uh, it, it, we were all, um, I think, probably frustrated by the thrombosis and thrombocytopenia issue that happened with AstraZeneca. That was going to be our workhorse vaccine and the, the Otagi advice, which was based on the epidemiology at the time, did, did undoubtedly lead to a significant slowing in the rollout because of a preferential recommendation. But government has always accepted that advice. They've worked on the advice the whole way through. Frustrated about, um, you say, I mean, the Prime Minister openly and publicly blamed Atagi for the delays and also indicated that he was pleading with them, constant, I think he was saying, uh, constantly to consider their position. I mean, the public management of this, what, from the Prime Minister's point of view, was the de these delays are due to a targi and I'm trying to get them to change their advice or to consider their advice in light of the outbreaks. And they did that, Senator. A targi did provide uh, subsequent advice that as the epidemiology changed. The targi advice has always been uh, considerate of the epidemiology at the time. When the original preferential recommendations were made, there was essentially no COVID in Australia. When uh, the Sydney outbreak took off. They, they changed their advice and made it very clear that in the context of an outbreak, that the preferential recommendation was, was far less strong. And I'm sure they'd be happy to comment on that. They did change their advice. So, well, so I'm happy we, to uh, have... Uh, I'm ha yeah, Professor Ching, would you like to respond to that? Because my reading yeah, so of it is that you never said AstraZeneca sorry. shouldn't be given to particular groups. So did you change your advice? So we had three statements on the 13th of July, the 24th of July and the um, 2nd of August. Um, the 13th of July was about COVID vaccines in an outbreak setting. Um, 24th was about the New South Wales um, situation specifically. And then the 2nd of August was about um, the Delta variant of concern and, the, and those outbreaks. Um, and I think what we were trying to convey was that there's a, a preference and a preference doesn't mean that it cannot be used, mm. um, but if it was to be used, it is in consideration of the risks and benefits. And the benefits are obviously greater when there is an outbreak when compared to whenever there isn't an outbreak. So in Western Australia at the moment, um, you know, we would still contend that um, the, um, the the risks of um, using AstraZeneca in people under 60 um, would outweigh the benefit in protecting. Um, um, but that's a, that's a personal decision. And some of those considerations are protecting the community. They're not really quantifiable in that sense. So mm. that's, a, that's a personal decision um, to be made. In New South Wales or Victoria at the moment, um, it is, you know, the, um, uh, the vaccine that you can get that protect you, protects you, those benefits of getting vaccinated are greater. Um, obviously, we still prefer Pfizer. Um, and so for those that can access Pfizer, then that's the one that, you, mm. um, that we would prefer, prefer that they get. So did your advice change though? I mean, because when I go it, back and read in, it- In the sense, so, so it's not inconsistent with how um, we had originally framed it. Yes, so we had exactly. originally framed yeah. it. So, the so emphasis, in, in perhaps. That sense, it didn't, in that sense, it didn't change, but yes. You're, yeah, it didn't you're right change. In saying that the emphasis. If I could speak to that, uh, uh, Senator Gallagher. Yeah. The original advice highlights that actually the context may change and yeah. those policy settings may need to change. Clearly, when that was evident that the New South Wales outbreak was really taking off at that stage, we sought to really reinforce those original aspects of the advice um, to highlight that actually now the risks and the benefits have changed in that context mm. and they continue to change. And you know we need the capacity to continue to be able to highlight when the context changes and those policy settings need to uh, pivot Mm. So when the decisions, Professor Murphy, you might be able to answer this, when the decisions did change to restrict um, AstraZeneca 
to um, the over 50s and then to restrict it to the over 60s. Who made that decision and on what basis? Who recommended that change and who made that decision? Thanks, Senator. So uh, the government made that decision um, acting on the Otagi advice. So as the Otagi members have indicated, they provided their advice to the Minister for Health. Minister for Health, the Chief Medical Officer and I immediately briefed the Prime Minister within you know, a very short period of time from receiving that advice. And the government made a decision that they should, as they have done throughout the pandemic, act on the medical advice and make the policy changes in accordance with that advice. So was it on your recommendation? Is that, I mean, well, there, based on previous evidence, I think there was about an hour and a half or less, perhaps, between the finalisation of the Otagi advice and a press conference um, being conducted. So who, who advised the Prime Minister to make this change? The Chief Medical Officer and I presented the the Otagi advice to the Health Minister and the Prime Minister concurrently. And yes. we supported that advice. And so, and they, they ultimately, they made the decision to make the programmatic changes consistent with that Otagi advice. Okay, but Professor Murphy, did you recommend that there be changes to the age group for particular vaccines? Because Otagi well, we didn't make that recommendation, they provided advice, and you're now saying it was actually the Prime Minister and the Health Minister, because I presume there wasn't a Cabinet meeting, who made the change to the vaccination rollout program based on age. Now, the, 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 the programmatic change was entirely consistent with the Otagi advice. The programmatic change was that Pfizer was the preferred vaccine for those under 50 and those under 60, but there was never a programmatic change uh, that uh, said that people under those ages could not get AstraZeneca. That was not a programmatic change. It was just that we knew that with that preferential recommendation that would, that would see a, a reduction in the use of AstraZeneca in that age group. The one programmatic uh, change that was made, and this was done in conjunction with all the states and territories, was to restrict the access to Pfizer for to the over 60s because of, at that stage, uh, because there were supply constraints. Atagi had not recommended that, but they had recommended that the Pfizer was the preferred vaccine for the younger people. So the programmatic change was entirely consistent with the Otagi advice, and it, it at no stage did it say that people under 50 or under 60 could not get AstraZeneca. It simply said that if they were to get it, it should be cognizant of that preferential advice, it should be cognizant of the risks of TTS, and that a proper informed consent process should take place. So it was completely consistent with the Otagi advice. But a decision taken of government and then a Prime Minister blaming that advisory body for providing that advice. I mean, refusing to take responsibility for the problems with the vaccine rollout by pinning the finger on this advisory group who's simply doing their job. And that advice was accepted by government at all stages? Accepted by government, but then the finger pointed at the advisory body and blamed for the slow vaccine rollout when everybody knows it was around the supply and lack of supply of particular vaccines that has led to the slowness of the vaccine rollout, not an advisory group of technical experts providing advice uh, through the health department. Can you see the, my point? The slow, no, the slowdown in the rollout was due to the unexpected occurrence of the thrombosis syndrome with the AstraZeneca vaccine, which, which led to a limitation in its use. It was a problem an unexpected problem with the vaccine. It was not uh, that, that led to that slowdown. Yeah, and you didn't have enough alternate vaccines to fill the gap. That's what led to the we slowdown. Have, we, we have uh, a very large forward supply of vaccines. I'm sure now, you, uh, but you didn't between yeah. April and, and September this year, which is when, the, we, we, when have, we needed we them the most. We had a supply a supply constraint because of the unexpected uh, issues with the AstraZeneca vaccine. And the lack of deals is... and the lack of supply of Pfizer. You can't just... There, if you're going to argue it's a complex situation and there mm. were a range of different things going on, you can't then ignore the fact that you didn't do enough deals and didn't get enough Pfizer as a, as a backup 
um, we put all our eggs in the AstraZeneca basket. We did not put all our eggs in the AstraZeneca basket, Senator. You know well that we made uh, several advanced purchase agreements. Uh, we got as much Pfizer as Pfizer could offer at that time. We've got uh, more Pfizer coming. We, we ordered we have ordered Moderna. We, we ordered Novavax early on, and that will still come. And we also ordered uh, the University of Queensland vaccine, which, as you know, had issues. So we had a very diverse and redundant supply of vaccines. Um, the AstraZeneca issue certainly uh, was was a curveball, and it was uh, it certainly did lead to a period of, of some supply constraint. But that's no longer the case. Was it Atagi's fault then? The delays in the rollout. I, I, w I don't would not characterise it as a Tagi's fault. I would characterise it as uh, a the occurrence of this condition that led to uh, a very complex discussion at a Tagi with lots of different views and a consensus position. And the government took that decision and acted upon it in mm. full. Were you surprised when you saw and heard the Prime Minister? Blame Matagi for the delays. I didn't see see that, Senator. You didn't see it, so you're finding out about no. that today, are you? No, I've read about it, and we've heard about okay, it. Okay, well, were you surprised when you read about it then? Look, uh, I, I don't think it's my role to comment on what the Prime Minister says in press conferences, Senator. Okay. Did you? You said you gave uh, you let Atagi know they had the government's full support. Um, mm, yes. Why did you do that following those comments? Uh, I can't recall the timing of it, but I have spoken to a TAGI uh, executive on a number of occasions, and as uh, TAGI co chairs have said, Minister Hunt has uh, dialed into their teleconferences and expressed his support, and Minister Hunt has expressed his support publicly in press conferences as well. This is a really complex issue. There is often no right answer to these uh, these positions and Atagi have come to a position that the government has accepted and supported. Yeah, I agree. They are complex, which is why it's, it's uh, you know, well, it's not surprising that the Prime Minister refuses to take responsibility and tries to blame some somebody else, in this case Atagi, who I think have, you know, done um, you know, Australia proud with the work that they've been doing week in, week out throughout this pandemic. Professor Cheng, just in conclusion, you said you would, um, in this article, it said it would help, Professor Cheng said it would help if the flow of information regarding vaccines was more transparent. Each little cog needs to know if another cog is planning a change. What did you mean by that? And, and how, how could we improve the transparency around this? Yeah, look, it's, uh, it's difficult. I mean, I think that, um, you know, if you think about sort of all the elements of the vaccine program, there's, you know, the companies developing it, there's the TGA that are evaluating that data, they're evaluating it them, you know, themselves, there's a target, there's the vaccine task force, there's the states, there's everything, uh, you know, down the track to uh, GPs, and then there's, you know, nurse immunizers and others that are putting vaccines in arms. It, it, I mean, you know, at the at the end of that, everyone sort of need all, all those sort of points in the chain. It is helpful for no, people to know what's about to come, so that they don't get surprised. So you know, equally for us issuing advice, it's helpful uh, certainly for the task force to know what we're thinking or um, what we might be considering even before we make a decision, so they can plan. But equally. We would like to know, you know, what is, uh, you know, what does the forward supply of vaccines look like? Mm. Um, you know, how will our pro how will our recommendations impact on um, those considerations? You know, those mm. considerations. But there are also things that, you know, clearly that are unknowable. So, um, you know, um, what is the New South Wales government or Queensland government or Victorian government thinking about? You know, at that time. Um, their attitude to lockdowns and um, you know, the likelihood of Delta escaping, you know, some of these things are just beyond, you know, a technical committee's um, sort of remit to, to know what's going on. But these are some of the unknowns that we had to contend with in trying sure. to make our decisions. So having um, information about, you know, things like, especially things like vaccine supply always helps with yeah. um, 
making our decisions. Yeah, sure. And you hadn't really got line of sight on that when during April to to June or July. Yeah, and yeah, and but I guess to be fair, I suppose you know it's coming from an international supply chain, so um, you know how much. Um, everyone else has uh, visibility of that is also not sure, but you know, it's clearly a very large unknown in what we're trying to um, make a decision on. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Cheng and Professor Blythe, for that evidence. Um, can I go to Senator Lambie and then Senator Davey, do you have questions too? And I know Senator Keneally. Yep, okay. Senator Lambie. Uh, Senator Lambie, are you there? We got no sound from you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. I don't have any for this segment. Thank okay. you. Sure, Thank no you. worries. Well, I'll go to Senator Davey and then Senator Keneally. Um, yeah, thanks. And, and they're essentially follow-up questions to your line of questioning, Senator Gallagher, so it sure. um, works out well. I just want to double check. Um, the the article with the um, PM, was it not actually, I, I interpreted it that the PM was actually stating a fact that when the program has to change due to the epidemiological changes, uh, the medical advice therefore had to change. So was it not the right thing to do? I mean, the consent forms and the advice and um, given to medical practitioners had to change because uh, because of the changes in, in the, the situation and the outbreak. Is that not, that's how I interpreted it. Who's that question to, Senator Davey? Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Cheng, maybe you want to comment about yeah. that? Yeah, uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, yes, I mean, that's true that um, there is, you know, the, after April and, um, you know, when some um, uh, clotting complication became um, evident that it was um, material uh, to people's decision making, um, then uh, people that are, you know, pro vaccine providers that are having conversations with patients would need to factor that into their discussion. And obviously, it's a relatively complex um, issue, so that required, you know, consideration of the materials that people would, con you know, use to consent patients with and um, to. Um, to uh, information sheets and so on. So that suite of packages, need, uh, the suite of documents needed to be developed um, in order to um, uh, to um, to support that. And then obviously we are also trying to make decisions in at a time where things are changing fairly quickly. So evidence was changing. Um, uh, we we had you know we had, we had uh, two cases in Australia and but in the UK they had many more. But as more information arose in Australia, then we had to incorporate that information in as well. So the information, particularly on what is the actual risk and how severe it was, um, obviously kept changing week by week. And we've um, tried to uh, put out statements each week to to reinforce that to say this is now what we know. And so people can, um, who are educated members of the public and um, and the, um, the vaccine providers that are supporting them making decisions um, can have that information to hand when, um, when they're talking to their patients about it. And um, you said it was always the case that um, while the uh, outbreak numbers were low, the preference was for uh, like once we became aware of the TTS um, issue, uh, then the preference was to um, prioritise Pfizer for the for the younger age groups, but uh, that there was a chance that in, if the outbreak expanded, that advice would change. Um, is, does that explain why we're seeing different approaches across all the states to um, the vaccination rollout? I mean, we've got a situation in Queensland where the Queensland Chief Medical Officer said she'd rather uh, not give AstraZeneca to young people because they had a higher risk of dying from the vaccine than, than uh, COVID. And they've now expanded access to Pfizer and Moderna to, to people up to 60, whereas other states like New South Wales are prioritising, 
prioritising doing it to the younger age groups? I, I mean, I think what what different public statements have reflected is how personal that decision is about the judgment of risks and benefits. It is more than numbers, um, and there are unquantifiable things about you know um, if you live with elderly or immunosuppressed um, relatives. Um, or um, you want to feel like you are contributing to protecting the community, they're not really quantifiable in the sense that, you know, what is my risk of going to intensive care or what is my risk of having long COVID? You know, those are probably more quantifiable. And some of that is a subjective um, decision. But equally, there are things that we know are quite important in that. So if in, uh, um, you know, Western Australia or Queensland where there is um, no or little um, COVID, then that risk and benefit decision is um, different than if you're in Victoria or New South Wales, where there are um, quite um, um, active outbreaks. And even within Victoria, you know, which part of Victoria you live in, um, whether you're a Uber driver or, um, you know, a farmer in, in regional Victoria is also clearly um, relevant um, context. So it is, uh, it is difficult and that's why we phrased it in that preference language rather than saying, you know, don't give it or, you know, we recommend um, uh, one, um, one course of action or another. Senator Davey, may I also add to that? Uh, ATAGI gives national advice, but the challenge is clearly the context and local epidemiology is different. So we've tried to frame our advice that is uh, uh, cognizant of that. And that is why we led with the Sydney outbreak statement, because clearly that is where uh, the policy settings needed to change, as opposed to in Western Tasmania or far north Queensland. Uh, and I can imagine this is one of the difficulties when you have to provide uh, holistic advice, but people have to make personal decisions, but they're making personal decisions based on reporting of your advice and reporting of incidences, and my understanding is we've had very, um, very few cases of TGS as a result of AstraZeneca. Is that correct? Uh, the TGA might be able to help there. About 141 cases, as I understand. Uh, John might be able to. Uh, John Skerritt might be able to confirm that. Hey. Yes. Uh, good morning, Senators. John Skerritt, uh, uh, Deputy Secretary, Department of Health, and head of the TGA. So. Uh, the really good, we've had 141 cases, but the really good news is that our fatality rate has been much lower than that feared at first and also uh, reported in the United Kingdom. So we've had eight deaths due to TTS, which amounts, if you do your math, math, mathematics, amounts to about a 6% fatality rate. The UK is still reporting a 17% fatality rate. Is that because... Um management of TTS has improved over time and we've learned lessons from um, our overseas counterparts, but also learned lessons here at home. Um, yeah. I, I just want to sort of reassure people as well who have read the negative headlines earlier, but we're not seeing a lot of, we're not seeing these good news headlines. I mean, 141 cases of TTS compared to how many doses of AstraZeneca have we given out? 11.3 million doses of AstraZeneca as of our last data cutoff, which is a week or so, because we are out of a lag in potential case development, Senator. So that's a very low case frequency. And if you look at the, the death rate, eight divided by 11.3 million is less than one in a million. And you get into comparisons with being struck by lightning and, and many other similar things. So there is a good news story here. I mean, it's obviously tragic for for those who have been uh, affected, either seriously ill, and indeed TTS is more common in younger women compared with younger men and compared with those over 50. Uh, but there is a good news story. And uh, I think you answered the question. There's been several reasons. Firstly, we had the ability to learn from the UK uh, because of the uh, uh, later start to the vaccination program in Australia that already vaccinated quite a number of people. Secondly, there was very high awareness and very high mobilisation to action by haematology groups and so forth. Uh, as soon as the first case in Australia was reported just before Easter, uh, all through Easter, uh, clinical groups uh, dropped everything and worked together on diagnostic criteria, on treatment, and therefore every hospital and indeed even GPs 
uh, had in our SEGP communicated uh, symptoms. Uh, uh, there was high level of awareness. What it meant is that there was a very large number of suspected cases reported, and many of those uh, turned out not to be TTS. There is a diagnostic blood test that can tell you if it is confirmed TTS. Probable TTS also has an unusual combination of very low platelets with clotting. But it is a good news story in that uh, if we had uh, projected based on the initial UK experience, we would have expected many more cases in Australia and many more fatalities. Um, and I'm, I think we've covered it in past committee hearings, but is the advice still currently, um, particularly for high outbreak areas, that um, if you sit down with your GP and have the conversation, AstraZeneca is suitable for um, for people below the um, age of, of 40 as well, uh, provided that it's informed based on informed consent. I, well, I think it's how your colleagues can, re can respond to that based on the wording in their most recent advice, Senator. Yep. So, Senator David, the advice has not changed. So, uh, TAGI still has a preference um, for an mRNA vaccine in those under the age of 60, acknowledging that in outbreak settings, actually, there's a greater imperative to access whatever vaccine one can at this stage. But importantly, as you point out, if a 40-year-old turns up to their GP, they're often AstraZeneca and have informed consent, a TAGI is okay with that. Great. Uh, that's all from me. Thank you, Street. Senator Davey. Senator Keneally, and then I'll go to you, Senator Steele John. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, I'd like to go back to uh, General Fruin's opening statement and thank him for that. Uh, there was some good information there, but there was some additional information I'm seeking in relation to disability. Uh, you provide us with percentages around residential disability care residents. Uh, but General Fruin, are you able to tell us how many and what percentage of NDIS participants are now fully vaccinated and how many and what percentage have received only their first dose? Have we lost the department? Oh, we've lost the center. Pardon me. Oh, we lost Pardon the center. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the, um, uh, thanks, Lieutenant General John Fruin, uh, Coordinator General COVID-19 Vaccine Task Force. With uh, NDIS participants, uh, there have been first dosed 173,236 people, which represents 64.8% first dose. And then there are 123,477 individuals who are fully dosed and that represents 46.2% of the NDIS participants. So 46.2% are fully dosed yep. and 64 have received their first. 64.8% yeah, first dose, thanks. And again, I thank you for the figures in relation to um, NDIS participants in shared accommodation and NDIS screened workers. Um, but are you able to also tell us uh, how many and what percentage of uh, residential disability care workers, the so people who work in residential disability care, are now fully vaccinated, and how many and what percentage have only received their first dose? That's just screen workers. The screen workers. But essentially, a subset of the. Uh, the uh, NDIS screened workers. I'm, oh, I'm actually okay. in no. residential disability. Senator, I might refer to Dr. James Hart, who may have that detail handy. If not, we'll take it on notice. But Dr. Hart? Uh, Senator Keneally, James Hart, First Assistant Secretary, Disability and Aged Care Rollout. We don't have that level of granularity, so we'll need to take that on notice. Um, the, the NDIS screened workers that General Fruin referred to. Um, this, it's a cohort of 200,500, so it's people who've actually been screened to work in the, in the NDIS, um, and it will actually cover a range of different cohorts. So um, we'll need to take that on notice, Senator. Thank you. I would appreciate that. Uh, given the comparisons and the discussion about prioritisation of disability and aged care, we have the figures for aged care, residential aged care. I'd like to see if we can get them for residential disability care. Um, on that um, 
on that broader point, I, I noticed that uh, in July, uh, I there was an article in the Guardian uh, talking about um, the inform uh, data collection for people with a disability more broadly for people outside of the NDIS, uh, that there are some 4 million Australians, uh, it was claimed to have a, a form of a disability who are not participants in the NDIS. Does uh, the department have any data on that broader cohort of people with a disability and their vaccination rates, or indeed that broader cohort of people with disability and what and um, their infection rates from COVID. Senator, in terms of, um, I might defer to, to um, Professor Kelly in terms of the infection rates, but in terms of, um, again, that's something I need to take on, on notice in terms of that broader community. Um, clearly, obviously, there's been a focus on those who are part of the NDIS because um, we can actually put in place some very good strategies to try and approach um, and offer vaccinations to that cohort. But our strategies are not necessarily limited to NDIS. I think if you look across the board of all the things that we're doing in terms of uh, GP in reach, setting up uh, hubs, uh, vaccination sites, uh, there are opportunities for people who, and that cohort may in, in include people who um, have chosen not to participate in the in the NDIS, and we know that within the Ind Indigenous area, and we're focusing in terms of reaching those people as well. Um, but it also um, it, there are um, opportunities in terms of our broader strategy to try and reach those people. I'll have to take on notice whether we can actually um, get you some data in terms of that broader community cohort. Well, in fact, um, I would even be interested to know if you're even collecting that data. Uh, I note that the article, which I'm happy to send to you on notice, uh, the Guardian Australia asked the Department of Health if it was now collecting data on COVID cases amongst all people with a disability, not just those within the NDIS, and the Department of Health did not respond directly. So are you even collecting that data in terms of vaccination rates and infection rates? Senator Tina. Sorry, Senator Tina Blewett, um, Deputy Coordinator General in the um, COVID-19 Vaccine Task Force. We are, in terms of um, uh, identifying that category for vaccination rates, uh, we're working with the Department of Social Services and ABS to see if we can pull data and use a range of sources to actually identify a broader... So, for example, we're looking at whether we can use DSP, you know, so disability support pension data, um, and other ABS data. So we don't have that right now, but it is definitely something we're working with uh, Department of Social Service and ABS on. Thank you, that's helpful, thank you. Um, can I come back to uh, what proportion of disability care residents have been vaccinated by states and territories rather than the Commonwealth? And I asked that question noting that the uh, Dr. Veach, the public health officer in Tasmania, said that initially the responsibility of this of vaccinating disability residents sat with the Commonwealth, that they still retain that responsibility. But as a state, we have been stepping in to support that Commonwealth uh, responsibility. Uh, and he made the point that, quote, the disability sector was lagging in getting vaccines. And so amongst a lot of other priority sectors, there were also steps taken by Tasmania to expedite that. Um, do you have any data on how, on the um, how what proportion have been vaccinated by states and territories, and what proportion have been vaccinated by the Commonwealth? I think we have to take that on notice, Senator Keneally. But the point generally has been that the disability community has been had access to all points of vaccination from the start. The states and territories clinics were always intended to provide access, and some of them have set up dedicated disability access points of present. So they've been, it's been a partnership the whole way through. So the Commonwealth and the states have had joint responsibility through multiple points of presence for the disability community, and certainly the states have played an important role. I think we probably could take on notice to see if we could break it down. Um, I'm not sure how helpful it is. The most important thing is that they've been vaccinated. Well, so, uh, so, it's helpful given that the uh, the uh, mandate of this committee is to oversight the Commonwealth's response to COVID-19. And I think part of that is understanding 
the efficiency of rolling out uh, vaccines to, some, to a group that was meant to be a priority in phase 1A. So it is important for us to understand that. Um, and I note your point about that people with a disability had uh, access uh, to all points of vaccination. But again, I come back to the uh, Royal Commission's draft report yesterday uh, that made the point that the Department of Health failed to consult people on um, with a disability and that directly affected people with a disability by curtailing their access to vaccines, that the La Department of Health's lack of transparency um, meant that people, uh, people with a disability didn't understand where they sat within the priority group, and the failure to provide information in accessible forms to people with a disability um, uh, contributed to people with a disability losing trust in the Australian government's handling of the rollout and created uncertainty and confusion. So while it's true to say they may have had access, they certainly lacked information uh, and support to be able to make that access according to this report, which is why I'm asking these questions. Um, can I go to the um, uh, statements uh, that are by the New South Wales Premier Gladys Berejiklian yesterday? She indicated that her state did not have any plans to delete, delay her reopening, uh, as in in um, be, and she's responding directly to the Disability Royal Commission's uh, draft recommendation that it would that the reopening should be delayed until everyone with a disability has a chance to be vaccinated. Um, what guarantee can you provide that Australians with a disability will be able to receive a vaccine uh, by the time uh, states reopen? And specifically, I'm thinking of New South Wales, which has now set a reopening date of 1 December. Can you guarantee that people with a disability in New South Wales will be able to receive a vaccine and be fully vaccinated by that date? General Fru will answer that, Senator. So, uh, Senator, we're working to ensure that uh, every Australian has access to uh, vaccines, um, and we're very keen that that uh, all sectors of the community, uh, as far as we can, start to reach those sort of rates um, at the same time. Um, I'm uh, particularly focused on a number of uh, groups at the moment. Uh, the disability sector is one of those where we are looking at opportunities to, uh, to continue to accelerate the rollout to those people. Um, I've noted that the disability residents and the disability workers are actually ahead of the national averages for fully vaccinated rates at the moment. So they are, they are progressing well at the moment. The NDIS participants uh, we are looking at uh, a range of measures to help bring them along more quickly. Um, I have been engaged with both the advisory group, state and territory stakeholders, um, and, and we've got another roundtable this afternoon on this. Um, and we're developing an acceleration plan to build on the work that's already been done in the sector that I'll be taking to uh, both NSC and then uh, National Cabinet later this week. But it, it, it looks to, and, and we've been working with the Disability Advisory Group in particular, to understand where they still see uh, potential barriers to higher rates of vaccination in some of the subgroups. Uh, the sorts of things that are coming out are coming out around uh, communications, and there has been very uh, specific tailored communications done in this sector, but of course there is always more we can do, so we are, we are working up uh, very specific community uh, uh, communications plans to, to different disability cohorts now, and we are also uh, working with them on things like where either access, ability to get to uh, points of vaccination, or where perhaps things like uh, stewardship at points of vaccination would be more helpful. And again, as the Secretary has said, this is all being done uh, in very close collaboration with the whole range of stakeholders in the sector. Uh, we uh, have in fact, sought specific feedback on our acceleration plan from the disability uh, advisory group uh, over the last two weeks. Uh, we have received that feedback. We're incorporating that into the plan that I will take forward. Uh, work has been going on, work is going on. 
uh, we're trying to make sure that we've got everything in place to make sure that there is uh, as, as few impediments as possible to getting uh, all of the people in the disability sector vaccinated as quickly as possible. Okay. Thank you. So, so, do you have a final question before I, I need to go to Senator Steele, John? Uh, no, I will. Uh, okay. I will. Uh, Thank you. Provide some time to Senator Steele, John, <laughs> Thank uh, you. and just joined us. Thank you, Senator Steele, John. You have the call. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, first of all, just uh, I think to to General uh, throw in it will be. Um, so you've you've given us figures of I think forty six percent double dose of the entire NDIS participant population and 64% uh, one dose so far. Um, are you able to break down both of those figures by in territory? Yep. Uh, are you interested in all of them, Senator, or particular states and territories? Uh, we'll start with, start with Victoria and New South Wales, but I'm interested in all of them. Okay, just let me get my numbers right here. Is that this here? Which is, I'm just making sure I've got the right number, 64.8. Okay, got it. So, first dose, New South Wales, 72.3%. Mm -hmm. Victoria, 68.6%. Queensland, 56.6%. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. South Australia, 56.6%. Mm -hmm. Western Australia, 53%. Mm -hmm. Tasmania, 62.3%. Mm -hmm. Northern Territory, 53.7%. Mm -hmm. And the ACT, 73.9%. Mm -hmm. For Fully vaccinated rates coming down the same list. New South Wales, 51.1%. Victoria, 47.4%. Queensland, 40.3%. Mm -hmm. South Australia, 43.5%. Mm -hmm. Western Australia, 37.8%. Tasmania, 49.4%. Northern Territory, 43.4%, and the ACT, 57.7%. All right, lovely. Thank you for that. Um, and would you be able to give us, I know in your opening uh, statement, General, that you've shared with us that um, some, I'm just pulling it up here, you say in your statement that um, uh, that 75.2% of the IS participants been shared accommodation uh, have been uh, given their first dose. Now, this yep. is a, a definition that the Commonwealth's been using for a while now, and I just want to get clarity on exactly what the definition is of, of shared accommodation or group homes that the Commonwealth is, is using there. How is that defined? James, but I Thanks, Senator. I'll, I'll go to Dr. Hart, uh, he, and he can give you the exact definition. Uh, thank you. Uh, Senator, the, the definition by which we work by for um, that cohort is two or more people living in a residential accommodation and they are age 16 and over. Right, okay. Um, can you tell me, because I know particularly, although not exclusively, in uh, New South Wales there are uh, institutions or structures on boarding houses, um, do, does that capture boarding houses to your knowledge? Sorry, it broke up a little bit for me there, Senator. Can, would you mind repeating the question? Sorry about that. So particularly in, in New South Wales, but in other states and territories too, there are there are kind of setting, residential setting houses. Um, does that definition cover uh, participants in boarding houses? I think it may or may not, depending on the jurisdiction, Senator, but certainly in terms of um, our focus on boarding houses has not been excluded from this process. We've certainly been working very closely with our providers to target um, participants in boarding houses as well. So um, it may not be captured within those statistics, but it is certainly a focus for us. All right. Would you be able to provide maybe on notice or later in, in the hearing? I'm particularly concerned about New South Wales and Victoria. So whether you could tell me whether that definition 
captures boarding houses in, in those states. Um, can do that. Be really useful. Um, in relation to, I'm sorry to, to do this to you, General, because it's I'm sure it's a bit tedious, but I get the same uh, state-based breakdown for uh, workforce vaccination rate, double dose and, and first dose? I may be able to assist with that, Senator, if that's OK. Um, yep. So that's, this is for our um, the the 75.2 and the 66.7 per cent that General Fru and read previously. Um, so I'll just read on a state by state basis uh, percentage for first dose. So New South Wales 77.9 per cent. And this is sorry, this is workforce, Mr. Hart. Is it? Oh, sorry. Oh, on the workforce, yeah. so, I misunderstood. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just looking for yeah, yeah. I'm just looking for uh, disability support workforce. Sorry. So these are our NDIS screen uh, workers, Senator. Yep. So yep. on a state by state basis, uh, percentage of workers who have received the first dose, 81.5 per cent for New South Wales, Victoria 78.7 per cent, Queensland 66.4 per cent, South Australia 67.3 per cent, West yep. Australia 64.0 per cent, Tasmania 76.4 per cent, Northern yep. Territory 76.8 per cent, ACT 81.0 per cent, and the um, the national total was 73.9 per cent. For the second dose, fully vaccinated, New South Wales 65.8 per cent, Victoria 62.6 per cent, Queensland 53.0 per cent, South Australia 55.9 per cent. Western Australia 49.7%, Tasmania 65.9%, Northern Territory 68.5%, ACT 71.6%, and the total was 59.3%. I might have jumped the gun there, Senator, but if you did want those um, breakdown by us on a state basis of those in uh, residential settings, I can provide that also. Yeah, if you, if you could, I'm also I'm aware of burning the committee's time. Are you able to just be able to email it to us so that I've got it in writing and we don't spend time just going through? Well, the that's numbers. okay. I'll, I'll work out how we can do that. Thank you, Senator. Thanks so much. I just wanted to move now to uh, to children. I know it's it's been a it's been a focus of our time as a committee uh, for for a couple of weeks now. Um, I'm keen to get the vaccination rates. Uh, for for people that have recently entered eligibility, which is the criteria of um, below 16. Uh, so is anybody able to give me that figure nationally? Yep, uh, Senator, the 12 to 15 year old cohort has been uh, very, uh, very positive progress. So in a little over a fortnight, we've had 382,918 uh, people come forward who are between 12 and 15, and that represents 30.8% of that uh, group having had first dose. And we've got uh, 21,631, or 1.7%, who are now fully vaccinated, but very quick uptake uh, occurring in that group. All right, and could you, uh, in the same uh, digitally circulated way, could you give me, uh, could you give me Based, territory based breakdown of that. Um, that would be that would be really useful. But could you just you have off the top of your head the New South Wales and Victorian figures for that same cohort, General? Uh, yeah, what I've got is I've got the numbers for New South Wales with the fully mm -hmm. vaccinated percent. I just haven't got the first dose percentage, but there are 116,753. 12 to 15 year olds have had first dose in New South Wales. Mm -hmm. And there are 6,691 12 to 15 year olds who've had, who are fully vaccinated. That's 1.72%. And mm -hmm. the population size is 388,999. We just have to do a calculation on what that first dose yeah, or, is. Yeah, lovely. Well, if, okay. if you could circulate that, that'd be, that'd be fab. Um, Thank you from your perspective, General. Um, uh, jumping back to the to the NDIS, the, this of um, of the rollout so far with the NDIS, 
What have you experienced as the as the primary challenges uh, with uh, in relation to vaccinating this particular cohort or getting vaccines to this cohort? I'll go to Dr. Hart, Senator. Oh, hello, Senator. Um, so I think um, earlier in the committee it was raised about the level of consultation that we have, and we have, uh, I think, worked quite closely with the Disability Advisory Committee. Um, they have raised um, issues which have also been on our radar through other mechanisms, and we, we, we are actually working very closely with the state and territories on that. Some of that can be um, the support services that are in place um, for dis people with a disability to receive that vaccination. Um, whether it can be um, going into being supported to go to a hub or for that inreach. Um, people with a disability um, is a general characterisation, but some people might require sedation as well. So there's quite an involved process to get through to that point. So, for example, um, some of the things that have been put in place that I know um, an NDIS um, and the NDIA and also DSS who we work very closely with. So. There's a few things that ha have um, come out of that. So partly has been, I think, the identification of, of people. So there is that, that data that um, Ms Blewett talked about previously, that we're trying to work with our colleagues in DSS and NDIA about that granularity of data on an LGA basis, that where we can target uh, assistance for vaccination. Um, there's also been, in terms of that, that mobility and accessibility, so uh, there was a temporary support that was put in place that Minister Reynolds announced um, by, to help NDIS participants attend an off-site location um, where that's been uh, relevant to do that. Communication, I think, has been a challenge as well, uh, Senator, I think that's fair to say. Um, so I can advise that there's been a number of, um, and again, this has come through the Department of Social Services, um, there's been a number of approach, uh, mechanisms to ensure that um, participant outreach, I think communication going out as well as communication coming in. So there's a number of in-reach um, services for communication uh, for providers, for participants that DSS has established. Um, also inboard, inbound call and digital notification strategy that have been set up. Um, Certainly our disability advisory group mentioned about the importance of reaching out. So um, mm. recently DSS have, uh, through their support coordinators and plan managers, have established relationships with the particip NDIS participants um, and commencing engagements with those participants regarding vaccination status and to offer arrangements, including bookings and transport. So I think uh, there's, it's a number of different fronts and I think a number of these things are still live issues. Um, we do work very closely, as I said, with the jurisdictions as well, and we have some very targeted meetings to work through some of those things coming up. But I think just in, ca in capturing that communication, um, of which there are a range of mechanisms um, in place to do that, um, support for, via transportation, um, also in reach mm. and increasing access. And I know the NDIA has partnered with the Pharmacy Guild around that as well too, to, to provide support. So it's no one thing that there are a number of, of, of different challenges to um, support people with a disability. Yeah, all right. S Senator thank, Steele, thank John, you that, do you have a final question? Uh, ooh, yes, I, I had I two, will come Jen. back to you. I will come back to you I'm through okay. the, all right. if you have a final yeah, question okay, now. Good. Yep. Yes, yep, yep, thanks. Um, so, so can I just ask, you mentioned in, res, in res, the line of questioning for, from my colleague, uh, I think this was from somebody at the general's table, in relation to capturing uh, disabled people who are not NDIS participants, and there was additional work that was being done around the DSP and other metrics to identify that community. Now, this worries me, if I'm honest, um, because uh, for instance, I am not an NDIS participant, so that measure doesn't capture me. Um, many of my friends are not, or have subsequently been removed from the end, you know, uh, either not needed the NDIS anymore, or have actually been kicked off in the last couple of years. So I'm really interested to know specifically when that, what that additional piece of work is that is being done, and when it is expected to be concluded, so that we can get a bigger picture of of the cohort. So, um, Senator, I think in the coming weeks we should expect to get a better picture of that broader 
um, cohort. Um, it is being driven through DSS and NDIA, and we can we can update the committee on that as well too as we move forward. But certainly, we um, I think within the task force we've taken a very um, educational approach to all of this, and we've always been open to other ideas and suggestions in, in which we can better um, target uh, people within a within a broadly defined cohort as such as disability participants, because we know that there are a number of mechanisms and a number of streams to support that work. All right, thanks. Thanks, Chair. Uh, probably by the time we get round again, Senator Steele, John. Um, thank you. I have a few questions on rapid antigen uh, testing or the rapid antigen tests that are in the media uh, today. Mm. So I think that probably covers you, Professor Skerritt, and the Department of Health. Um, to begin with, when will rapid antigen tests be available to Aussies who will soon be able to self swab for a COVID test, which is what the Daily Telegraph tells us today. So rapid antigen tests are already available and they can be done under very limited supervision by a bank manager or a foreman with a, with a company that just has a line of contact through to a pharmacist or a nurse or other health professional. So a very wide, I should put on record, but a very wide range of industries, not just aged care, are using these tests extensively now and have been for the last uh, month or two. Uh, however, what was announced uh, yesterday was that uh, as of uh, November 1, uh, we're and, and it is dependent on obviously tests being approved and tests to be approved have to have uh, the required information. Uh, as of November 1, we uh, will, uh, have home tests available for self-purchase for people to get on the internet, to pharmacies, convenience stores, whatever channels they want to get. We're working very actively with a range of companies because the current tests are designed for professional use and they're not home tests. Uh, even though the little cartridge will be the same, everything else will be quite different in a home test. And we're working with those companies to transform those tests to make them suitable for home tests. Now, the other thing that's emerged in the last few months, of course, is when a lot of these home tests were developed for Europe and the US and North America, we didn't have much Delta around. And so absolutely critical is to check that they perform well with Delta. Okay, and, and you're, you're doing that. I'm interested in why there's this hard um, date of the 1st of November. It seems unusual. Usually when you're going through your processes, you go through them and then there's an announcement when you've finished that. It seems to me you've given yourself a hard deadline and why is that and where did it come from? Uh, so, Senator, at the moment they're not permitted in law, so there actually needs to be a, a change of subsidiary legislation for which a date has to be specified sometime in advance. We also believe that it will be that several uh, stars will align around about the 1st of November. Most importantly, the companies will be ready uh, some are more ready than others now, but there is no company that is ready today to go to market in Australia with a home test that, uh, that meets the requirements. For example, we're still waiting, and it may be another week or so, from data from the Doherty Institute and hopefully also the New South Wales Government on comparative performance of different tests against Delta using common criteria. So we, the Delta thing is really important. So no test is ready today. That's the first thing. The second, the second thing is that... Uh, as we all know, by the end of October, early November, we will be at a level of vaccination in the community where the implications of a false positive or a false negative, and false negatives are more common with these tests, are less so because we have higher background rates of vaccination in the community. And, and the third star that will align, as I said, is that uh, uh, the companies will also be in a position to have uh, products ready for distribution. So, for example, they can't merely take an existing product that might have been in the market in China or Germany or somewhere, uh, they have to have an, a product which has an Australian contact number, a 1800 number, where people who might get two bands, maybe they're faint, maybe they don't know what to do, they're worried that they haven't done the test correctly. Uh, companies in Australia, as is the case for HIV tests, will be required to have a 1800 number. And so the actual packaging uh, will be Australia specific and it'll have things like a contact number and the hours that that contact line will be open. So there are a few steps, but we've been working very close with companies over the last four or five weeks on, on this issue. Okay. 
So you said at the beginning that there is that these have been wi quite widely used over the last month or two in specific settings. So we are aware of a trial, I think, in, in Greater Sydney in aged care facilities. Um, are there other areas where it's being widely used? And how does that reconcile with you saying there's no tests ready today? Is that the difference between no, home use uh, and, and you know, in a, in a workplace? Institutional use, we'll call it. Yeah. So the current yeah. requirement, so currently the tests are designed for being used on significant numbers of people, the, the, the boxes or an individual many, many times. So the boxes are several hundred dollars, not the sort of thing that, that most people would be able to front up and go to the yeah. pharmacy and buy. They contain, they may contain 20 tests, they may contain uh, uh, 40 or so tests. I've even got one behind me if, if I could use a prop. So currently the tests are designed for institutional use. Uh, secondly, the instructions are designed for someone who has already had training. And that's a very big difference between a home test where you want essentially usually a year seven reading skill, uh, maybe for people with English as a second language, very simple, often graphical instructions. And so the current tests that are being used in a number of businesses, banks, construction sites, transport companies, Woolworths, I believe, in their logistics grocery centres, and I can go on and on. Those tests, the local supervisor or foreman has had a bit of training and they have a pharmacist or a nurse or a doctor, but usually a pharmacist or a nurse, and there are companies that provide these stuff on tap because the current tests are not designed for use by someone without training. Okay. So that would lead me to why this big splash today that is being sold as Aussies will soon be able to self-swab at home when the evidence you're now providing me is that there are no tests ready and there's a whole range of work that has to be done before anyone at home is going to be in a position to use that one of these tests. Oh, no, I, I think the word soon is quite accurate. Uh, uh, it all depends. If you think soon is tomorrow morning, it's not that soon. But uh, remember, we're almost at the end of September. We're, we're talking uh, four weeks yeah. away. But we we're get. opening so, up in the next uh, few weeks, you know, in new people in uh, my area, my <laughs> neck of the world. Yes. Well, I, I, we consider that we consider that soon, and we believe over that period, okay. the companies will have product here in Australia that has been through all the requirements for self testing, has one eight hundred numbers, has had user testing by people who aren't trained professionals, and and will be ready to go. And, and okay. I think that will be soon. So November one is when the regulation will. Um, come into effect is what you're saying. That's why the hard November 1 deadline, but you've still got a fair bit of work to do. I guess the questions that come from this is, um, you know, the states and territories, presumably, do they have to go through some regulatory change as well to allow um, this uh, product? And how will okay, that be managed? So, okay, so let me go back again. The regulatory change comes in on November 1st, but as Companies have already informally submitted data to us, and that's been for several weeks, and we've been reviewing it and going back to a company saying, hey, you actually have to do a user test, and it can't be just with one person. So we have we have a team of people who are on the phone all the time with these yeah, companies. Yeah, sure. Uh, as of October 1, if they believe they've ticked all the boxes, they can put a formal submission in. Now, normally, these submissions take six or eight months to review. We will review them in a matter of a couple of weeks. Then they can order their stock in, they can commence some packaging with the Australian instructions. But we are still confident that because we've been holding hands with some of the most advanced companies for a few weeks, that by November 1, there will be product available. There won't be product available on October 1 or whatever just because of all these steps. Now, under states and territories, uh, there is no need for states and territories to pass additional regulations. Some states and territories may decide under public health orders, and it will be a decision of their chief health officers uh, to mandate reporting of any positive tests. Uh, so some states and territories may say, hey, we want to know about every positive, every positive test. That's really a decision for the states and territories. Uh, but different states and territories can use these tests in the same way. What we can't do as a Commonwealth entity is to legislate or regulate separately for different states and territories. As you'll know, that's not permitted under the Australian Constitution. Sure. So again, I'm trying to pin down 
when you think this product will be available. Um, so you're saying that you can concurrently, people will be developing their product in your approval time, so between October and, and November. Uh, then states and territories will have to arrange their own you know, processes around what, what getting a positive um, rapid test means in terms of their own public health orders. Is that correct? So there's no regulatory change, but how it works into their COVID response is is up to the well, each one. Well, that's a matter for the states. Yeah, that, okay. that one is a matter for the states and territories. And my colleague, uh, Professor Kelly, may want to talk about his discussions at AHPTC on that one. But there is no need for CGA regulation on that point. Okay. Uh, I want to emphasise that I do believe companies will be ready, but I don't think they'll be ready long time before November. So. Even if we were to make the date 10th of October, I doubt any companies would be ready. But I think there will be companies who will be ready to go with, with stock uh, on the 1st of November. But Professor Kelly might want to comment on the process with public health orders. I guess, again, this announcement's been made. Is there a national agreement about how these products are going to be used, where they're going to be used, how they're going to be used, how people will get hold of them? I mean, this announcement leads to a whole range of questions and have, have those decisions been taken uh, by National Cabinet? Who's coordinating that work? Do they need to be taken under supervision? I mean, all of these questions flow from the decision, uh, from the announcement today. I don't know whether I'll that's the dependent... And, and Sorry? I'll only answer one of those and turn to my colleagues. There's obviously a lot of active discussion at forums, including some of the ones you've mentioned. But if a home or self-test, by definition, does not have to be taken under any supervision. The current tests, so which are being run at places like Woolworths now, do have to be run under supervision, but it doesn't have to have a doctor or a nurse on the premises. But, but perhaps uh, Professor Kelly uh, may, may wish to uh, discuss the discussions with the states and territories at ADPPC. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thanks, Senator. So, uh, so there, you know, there are changes to foot as you've as you've hi highlighted in your question, and and as uh, Professor Skerritt has mentioned in terms of of who can use these these rapid antigen tests, but they've been around for quite a while. They're, certainly, yeah. they have been part of the of the process uh, under supervision, as they are currently regulated to be, um, uh, you know, for since last year. So the the, the public health. Um, Laboratory Network and the Communicable Diseases Network of Australia, both subcommittees of the Australian Health Protection Committee have done extensive work uh, in relation to their use and their different use in different settings. Um, I think uh, Professor Skerritt mentioned that when you're, when you're wanting to absolutely hone down and get every single case, uh, these are not usually the ones that are used in these sort of circumstances uh, because we have our PCR testing in our laboratories and that's what we've relied on up to now. But as we move into uh, a, a time of living with COVID, uh, there will be different use uh, of these rapid antigen tests. So there's a, a document, happy to um, table that at, with the committee if you would like, but it's a public document uh, which goes into those, the, all of those things. Just in relation to state and territory discussions, we've had many discussions about, about testing, including rapid antigen testing at AHPPC over, well, since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, there are some, some states which, because they were really um, in that suppression with no community transmission phase, which in fact all states are still in, um, uh, but I take the example of Western Australia, for example, they have very specific regulations uh, under their, chief, their public health orders um, about the use of rapid antigen tests. Uh, they would need to look at those in those new circumstances. Okay, so there might be areas that it's not you're not able to use them in your home. Is that what you're saying? Um, at the moment, but I, I would imagine that, uh, well, I, I'm absolutely certain that, that it will be embraced right across the country once those those changes that Professor Skerritt has mentioned are made. Okay, but is, Senator, there, I, is there going to be sorry, national Senator. consistency on the use of rapid antigen testing in this country or not? Senator, we can't uh, predict what individual states and territories would do. For example, South Australia and Western Australia have public health orders that actually prohibit the use of rapid antigen testing for diagnosis of a disease. But that's actually not inconsistent, to use a double negative, uh, with the widely held view. These are not black and white gold standard diagnostic tests. They are valuable screening tests. 
and the advice that every company will have in their videos, instructions and 1-800 call lines is if you come up positive, go and get a PCR test straight away. Okay. So the actual current public health orders don't preclude rapid antigen testing being used. Now, I don't have a crystal ball about what states and territories may decide to do in the coming weeks, though. Okay. And so uh, for argument's sake, again, reading the telly that, uh, today that Aussies will soon have access to this. I say I get a positive um, rapid test. What do I do then? You see, well, there's two. Sorry, there's two types of tests that, or companies that we're talking to. Some uh, just are like a pregnancy test, where you'll have to look at two bands, and two bands means you know two stripes on a dipstick uh, tells you that uh, it's positive. Those instructions will say, please go to uh, have a have a PCR test. Now, it is possible that some states and territories will put in a public health order that legally requires any individual to uh, get, um, to do it, rather than okay. asking them not to it. Uh, but, but we don't other, know other yet. Companies, no, we don't yeah. know yet. And other companies actually have integrated things where you can use your smartphone that automatically transmits the result. Okay. It seems like there's so, a so lot, lot of questions to resolve before Aussies get one of these in their homes, I would say. Exactly. We're very busy. Mm. Sorry, Senator, just from the Australian Health Protection Committee, point of view, which I'm the chair, as you know, um, we're certainly continuing to work very closely with all states and territories. And as we've done throughout this pandemic, um, aiming towards national consistency is, is it's our been hard to reach, purpose. hasn't it? It's been pretty hard it to reach been, in and, any area. Continues, continues to be. I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, use that as a measure of success, because right. I think when you look at it on schools, borders, <laughs> masks, all of it, you haven't been able to reach national consistency. Um, in this article in the Telegraph, also it says, asked if a delay in rollout of a rapid antigen tests for home use in Australia was a deliberate strategy until there were higher levels of vaccination in the community, Professor Skerritt said, correct. So I guess, again, when you look around the world, we're, you know, we seem to always be between six months behind what is happening in other comparable jurisdictions on management of COVID, where we have had rapid antigen tests part of um, certainly public use in a, a number of countries for, for a long period of time. Why is it that we, are, we always seem to be, you know, three to six months behind? What is the, you know, the Australian okay. reason for that? And why was it a deliberate strategy to delay, well, well, to delay the rollout of rapid testing? So, Senator, those words, and they are my words, but they were taken out of context because they've taken snippets of uh, sentences and, and, and uh, transcripts. But uh, it goes back to what I said earlier, that uh, a test that might have been used in the UK in March, April, that really was great for the UK variant, but was 20 or 50 times less sensitive for Delta, would actually cause major public health harm if it was rolled out without rechecking how well it worked for Delta. Sim similarly, uh, the uh, situation has been different in Australia in terms of vaccination coverage, but also in terms of levels of uh, infection in the community. And there's been a lot of work shown, but at low prevalence levels, you've got to really use these tests very frequently in order to, uh, to uh, get their full utility. So, the, the, the choice of the word deliberate may have been a poor choice on my part, but I wanted to emphasise the fact that just because something might have been used with the Alpha variant in April in the UK, it isn't automatically transferable to the Australian situation. Mm. But a number of countries who are even listed in this article have been dealing with Delta and seem to be dealing, part of dealing with Delta has been to use rapid testing as well. I mean, your, your argument there is that because of the slow vaccination rollout and the low levels of vaccination, that has delayed other treatment or diagnostic um, technologies on top of that. So it's almost like a, a double well, hit, you know? Not only are you really, not vaccinated, you don't get access to the rapid testing either. No, no, but the point that perhaps has been missed, the point that's been missed perhaps in this is the background infection rates and the Australian approach to contact tracing. So where a lot of these tests were used, uh, for example, in New York City, they were used quite a few months ago when uh, 
the background infection rates were extremely high and uh, there was no attempt to be able to individually contact trace every single infected person. The resources just wouldn't have permitted it. And we still have to remember that in some of these places like the US and the UK, uh, we're still seeing death rates and infection rates order of magnitude or more above Australia when you correct for relative mm, population. Sure, so, but there's a lot so of... It, yeah. Australian use is different. Uh, even, in, even in a city like Sydney, I mean, on one hand, we sit back and we go, gee, we've got seven, eight hundred, uh, maybe a thousand COVID cases. In a city of seven million, that is, while, while that's a, a, an important public health issue, when you looked at comparative rates at the peak of London and, and New York and so forth, they were much higher. Mm. And so they were really contact tracing. And that's why the gold standard PCR test has been important. So there's been a number of reasons why such as making sure they're suitable for Australian conditions, the instructions, the, the usage, the packaging and all that, and most importantly, testing against Delta. Again, when those countries had their earlier peaks, uh, Delta was not a prevalent strain. And it does seem that some of the tests, and I don't want to name particular products, but some of them are quite significant products, uh, are much less sensitive against Delta. And that's why we're uh, working with the Doherty Institute to actually test uh, many of the major products first. Okay, my final question, um, Professor Skerritt, in the article, it, uh, I think, or there was another article I read where it said you were waiting for the green light um, from government to progress this. What does that mean? I mean, it seems to imply that you, you know, that the government was going to give you an instruction about whether you could, when and how you progressed rapid antigen testing. Now, look, the decision on uh, on when on the start date is actually made by the independent regulator, so it's made by us. But we realise in a pandemic you have these discussions, and there's an awful lot of discussions going on, including about state and territory acceptability, including about tracing the results, including about what conditions to put on. So it's a discussion with government, and the government hasn't slowed down the approval of rapid antigen tests. I think if you go into the media, Minister Hunt has said many times he's really keen. Uh, so the green light again refers to all those issues I was talking about before. I don't have a green light about Delta at the moment, for example, well, but I'm sweating on it, and, and I will read that uh, that report as soon as it lands on my desk about Delta. So sure. in, in that way, we're waiting on a green light. Okay. Uh, we have okay. discussions with government, but the decision is ours. So is the journalist wrong me. then when it said, speaking on Monday, Professor Skerritt said the TGA had been waiting on a green light from the government to progress approvals. They weren't talking about think, a whole range of green lights. It seemed to me that if, you know, a common person reading that, as, as yeah. I am, would read that to believe that you were waiting for some indication from government about how to handle rapid antigen testing. Is that correct or not correct? We have been correct? discussing with government, uh, and of course it's not just me, it's many of the other colleagues from our department who are, who are on this thing. So we've been discussing rapid antigen testing with government several times a week for the last few months. So what's uh, waiting for the green light then? Well, I, I indicated to you that there's a number of factors that relate to a green light. Uh, and yet I've also emphasised the fact that it's actually a TGA regulatory decision, mm. not only on individual tests, but also on the timing of making a legislative instrument to more mm. broadly allow the tests. So, so, I, I so you, weren't I waiting on, you weren't waiting on a green light from government then? We we were not waiting on a green light as government saying you must bring in these tests as of tomorrow. In fact, uh, the green light is a, is a combination of many factors that some of which are internal to us, some of which are, for example, Doherty testing. But it is important to have these broader discussions about where they fit at the stage of a pandemic. So I think uh, like a lot of things, and particularly in that media outlet, there's been an oversimplification in how it's been presented, unfortunately. Um, I will so go. You know, I just want to make one point yeah. that there was an absolute national consistency until while we were trying to have no community transmission, HPPC and all of and national cabinet were all of the view that rapid antigen testing were of no value because we wanted to get every single case, and so PCR tests were the goal. And it's only now, only now that we have community transmission and we're starting to transition to living with COVID that these tests are applicable and we are pulling out all stops 
to get the regulatory approval done as quickly as possible so that, and then National Cabinet will consider their role in the reopening plan. They are a very crucial part of our plan, but they haven't been useful in Australia until now because it was not appropriate to have them. For most of the pandemic, we have had no community transmission at all. And if uh, Dr. Uh, Mr McBride has been doing a, a, a solid piece of work in the department with all the states and territories on the rollout of rapid antigen testing, and if you want to get more information, I'm sure he'd be happy to describe how the, how the rollout has been planned. It was really my interest was piqued by this drop to the Telegraph uh, and subsequent media um, conference this morning, which indicated that you were ready, really ready to go. But it sounds to me like there is a lot more work to do uh, before we get here, uh, and a lot more questions that need to be answered. And you know, we have had community <coughs> transmission for months. Millions of Australians have been locked down for months. People, you know, it's not just um, at the severe and end of COVID. Test, mm. rapid antigen tests are widely used. Mr McBride, you wanted to describe just how, how widely they are being used at the moment? Well, but the pro Sorry, I, and we are running out of time, but the issue here is <coughs> the story is that it's about home testing. I'm not disputing that they are being used, but the promise but from the government is that they'll be used yeah. in the home and they'll and be available soon. Yeah, home testing is only part of a puzzle. I think I think if we say it's all about home testing, then we're really ignoring the fantastic work that's being done in aged care, being transport companies. No, I'm not. I'm not trying to ignore that. Banks and, other places. and so it is important to emphasise that over the last couple of months, these have been very widely used. Mm. Yeah, but again, I think the point of the story is to give hope, particularly to millions of Australians who've been locked down for months, that there is another technology coming to assist um, the opening up. And it just seems to me that it's a little bit underdone. But I will go to Senator Patterson. I was hoping to let Atagi and um, the TGA go at the break, if that's possible. I know I have a, just a couple of questions for Atagi just from a you know use of people's time point of view. So Senator Patterson, and if others could indicate if that's a possibility. Thanks, Chair. Yes, I'd be happy um, for them to be released. Um, and speaking of uh, the hope that you talked about, I want to focus on the reopening plans that have been outlined by the state governments that are, and state and territory governments that are under lockdown. And particularly in the context of, I think it was the other day, the OECD, Australia has been recognised by having the second lowest fatalities in the OECD. That's right, isn't it? Yes, Senator. Professor Kelly can comment on that. Um, that's that's correct, Senator. I think um, you know, in in the uh, in the general conversation about how we're going with the pandemic, uh, obviously um, uh, that sort of uh, comparison with international rates is often lost. Um, the the latest figures I've got uh, from yesterday shows that we're the third lowest in terms of cumulative death rate and and death, deaths per, uh, deaths per hundred thousand population this year. So in comparison, we've had, you know, very tragically, 336 people up until yesterday have passed away from COVID-19, mostly in New South Wales, but more recently in Victoria and one in the ACT. Um, that compares with the US, 336,000, so 1,000 times. Um, uh, that's just this year. Um, United Kingdom, 62,907. So. Um, the, the rate per 100,000 there, just to make it a, a level playing field, it's 100 per 100,000 in the US, 92 per 100,000 in, in the United Kingdom, 1.3 in Australia, um, third lowest in the OECD. Uh, last week, I, I, a few weeks ago, so it's a little out of date, but I, I did see uh, um, some compa another comparison. So at that point in early September, there'd been 663,000 deaths in the US uh, throughout the pandemic. Um, that's one in 500 Americans, one in 500, uh, and one in 35 over 80s uh, in the US. You, you, everyone would know someone who died, has died from, from COVID. In, in Australia, uh, up to yesterday, there's been 1,245 deaths, uh, tragically, here in Australia. That's about one in 20,000 Australians. Um, so a very different um, uh, comparison there uh, during that period. Yeah, look, that's a remarkable result uh, in terms of fatalities. And um, hopefully, if we get the reopening right, Australia can have both low fatalities and a very high degree of freedoms quickly returned. And so that's what I want to turn my focus to. How well placed are we to 
consistent with the national plan, start to reopen at those 70 and 80 percent double dose intervals. Uh, it's going very, very well, um, Senator, and, and I, I think it's you know, largely due to the the the, uh, the you know, rapidly rising vaccination rate that has been mentioned uh, and uh, described by General Fruin. Uh, it's really been key to to those differences. I, I just I just sorry to to harp on deaths. Obviously, we you know we we would hope there were none, but uh, very different situation last year and this year. Like last year, we had. Mm. 909 people died in the 28,423 cases that we had. That's a death rate of 4.5%. That was mostly, uh, as we know, in, in older Australians uh, and many of those in aged care, uh, at residential aged care. In 2021, we've had <coughs> 70,609 cases. That's up to yesterday with 336 deaths. That's a death rate of less than half a percent. Um, mm. Uh, which demonstrates um, very much the protection that comes from vaccination. So we, we know from the Doherty modelling and from uh, other work that's that, that's been done uh, that uh, as as that vaccination rate increases across the community, it does give protection not only directly to people that are particularly those in the more vulnerable members of our community, um, but uh, also indirectly in terms of stopping the transmission from person to person. So. Um, I saw it described recently that uh, uh, you know, vaccinated people can still um, uh, become infected, they can still be infectious, um, but uh, they, they, they are not as infectious as, as people who have not been vaccinated. They are less likely to be infected than those that have been vaccinated. They're far, far less likely to have severe illness um, uh, compared with those that have not been vaccinated. So for all those reasons, and, and um, Professor Murphy might want to talk about the uh, the work that he's been leading uh, with with the secretaries uh, of state and territory departments around the the preparedness of the of the um, healthcare system to uh, in in those new fa in those phases of reopening. Uh, but what we know is that we we are well prepared. Um, uh, that that uh, we can cope with some some cases. Uh, we have treatments that are coming online as well that can assist with that. Uh, and so all, all of those matters uh, are, are in train. I think the very key component of that is that, that Australians need to get used to living with COVID, that every single case is not a, not a tragedy. Um, uh, cases will be found, there will be cases, there will be cases, uh, particularly in those that are not vaccinated, there will be cases in children. And we need to work through uh, those as being a, a normal part and parcel of living with this disease as many other countries are doing so. Mm. So how far away are we from those 70? Does the department have a forecast of how far away we are from the 70 to 80 percent figures nationally and in, in those key lockdown states like the ACT, Victoria and New South Wales? So Senator John Fruin, Coordinator General, um, these are estimates. Estimates are of course based on uh, supply points of presence but then public willingness to come forward which I've uh, mentioned earlier. So the, the variable in there, I think increasingly from here on in, is about whether people come forward. So I please uh, I offer these estimates in the spirit of the numbers can change. Um, we think nationally we get to a 70% second rate dose uh, towards the end of October. Mm -hmm. We think we get to potentially get to an estimated 80% second dose around mid-November. Um, and it's conceivable that we could get to 90% uh, if the public keep coming forward, uh, you know, by the end of November, start of December. That's that's a best case. Now, which jurisdictions are you interested in specifically? Uh, the lockdown ones, Victoria, New South Wales and the ACT. Okay, so in Victoria, we think they get to 70% potentially by the end of October. Uh, to 80% about the same time, middle of November, and they could get to 90% uh, sort of early, late November. In New South Wales, uh, they get to 70% potentially in about a week's time. They could get to 80% uh, mid, later October and they could get to 90% conceivably within the first two weeks of November. 
In the ACT, uh, we think they get to 70% uh, within the next fortnight. They could get to 80% mid, late October. Uh, and they could conceivably be at 90% by the start of November. Hmm. That, that's remarkable, um, incredible progress. Um, how will we assess the individual state and territory plans of those three relevant states for reopening against the national plan? Um, some appear, like New South Wales, to be going a bit faster. Um, some, like the ACT in Victoria, appear to be going a bit slower. Uh, Senator, obviously these discussions are happening at National Cabinet and all of the states have... Uh, territories have signed up to the national plan. Um, they're, 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 they are waiting on detailed jurisdictional modelling uh, for each state. And I think what's become clear from the modelling is that there will need to be some differences depending on the caseload in each state. So uh, the, the modelling has shown that if you go into the 70% with a large number of cases, uh, you probably need to maintain more uh, public health measures than if you're going in with a low case low because you can do more uh, stringent testing, tracing, tracing, quarantining and isolation. So, so I think as we've seen throughout the pandemic, there will be um, some, in, some variations that are based on the epidemiology. I think there, there are some of the states and territories are more conservative than others, but essentially uh, all states and territories have agreed to take the first steps at around 70% fully vaccinated and to take more significant steps around 80%. And national cabinet's continuing to discuss those. Senator, mm -hmm. just on that model. Yes, Senator, sorry. I may just add to those uh, estimates that I gave you. I'll note that those three lockdown states are anticipated to reach those three levels potentially ahead of all other jurisdictions. Yeah. Um, just on that modelling, though, um, Professor Murphy, it has been shown so far to be probably excessively cautious, um, maybe even alarmist, uh, in terms of the, the deaths and the ICU uh, admissions that we're expecting in New South Wales is just one real world example against that modelling. Um, is an excessive reliance on cautious modelling the, the right pathway, given the enormous costs of ongoing lockdowns on people's health and wellbeing? So I think modelling um, uh, is always, uh, there's always an element of artificiality about it and we have, and we've had different models. So, so the, the, the modelling New South Wales had some modelling done by the Burnett Institute, which was uh, a little bit more pessimistic than some of the Doherty modelling. Um, I think what we what National Cabinet is learning in this uh, state and territory working group that I and a colleague in the Commonwealth Department are leading, we are learning from the real world experiences. So the New South Wales experience is going to be very valuable to guide any refinement of that modelling and refinement of approach. And similarly, the Victorian experience will be as well. So, so I think there have been different models and uh, I think you're absolutely right that um, the experience in New South Wales has been pleasing in, in you know, recent days or weeks that we have seen a curtailment, uh, almost certainly due to the vaccination uptake of the pandemic and a curtailment of the predicted rise in cases. So that, that, that information will be fed back uh, into the modelling and, and I'm sure all the states and territories will be looking at that. This is an iterative process and mm. uh, I think that uh, uh, certainly the lockdown states are very keen to open up as soon as they can, but, but you're right, there are some there are some that are more conservative than others. Okay, just just two final questions, um, conscious of the time. One is um, the ongoing need for hotel quarantine, um, particularly in those states that do have widespread community transmission. Um, it, it's generally been the case over the last month that there's been at worst one or two cases a day in hotel quarantine in New South Wales and Victoria, when there's been many hundreds, if not thousands of cases in the community. How much additional protection is hotel quarantine offering given the very high cost that ha that has. I mean, I think it was a, a necessary thing prior to vaccination, but now that we have vaccination, it's a different equation. I'll get Professor Kelly to answer that soon. Uh, thank you, Senator, for the question. So that, 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 that is a live issue. I think you've, you've pointed that out and uh, because, of the, because these uh, data are, are shared 
widely and publicly every day, it, it's become pretty obvious where the where the problem is. The problem is in local transmission uh, in New South Wales, uh, as you've as you've pointed out. Uh, it's uh, uh, we're getting a handful of cases uh, through the hotel quarantine system, and thousand you know up to fifteen hundred, I think was the was the max was the highest rate uh, number in New South Wales a couple mm. of weeks ago. So, so it is a, a, a an immaterial number at the moment. Uh, in in uh, Howard Springs, for example, in the Centre for National Resilience, uh, again, uh, almost two thousand people in that centre at the moment. It's been rare over the last few weeks, even even including the, the uh, evacuees from uh, from Afghanistan, uh, to have more than two or three cases in that in that group. So, so it's becoming less uh, of a problem. Uh, partly that's because of the mitigations that are happening before people travel, so having tests before they leave and wearing masks and the like. Uh, so it's, it's a live question about what, you know, what, what uh, needs to be done there into the future, and, and it's certainly part of the national plan is to, is to pull back on what is required at the, at the, at the national border. There are and many pilot projects at the moment in New South Wales, in South Australia uh, and other states uh, to look at alternatives uh, in terms of quarantine. And that's very encouraging, and I'd be just keen to accelerate that as much as possible. Chair, just one final question, if I could have your indulgence, please. Um, what is the public health rationale for two states, in namely Victoria and New South Wales, that have similar rates of community transmission to have closed their borders to each other? What are they protecting each other from by continuing to close their border to each other? I, I think... Uh... I, I would I would suggest you you, you put that question to the uh, the medical advisors in those two states. Uh, so Does that mean that you're not aware of a, a public health rationale for it that there isn't one? Uh, I think <coughs> I'll just stick with that answer. Fair enough. Um, Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Senator Patterson. Uh, I just. I would like to let Atagi and TGA go if possible. Um, so I haven't had anyone indicate they have further questions for them. I have I have uh, one or two, which if you give me indulgence for a couple of minutes and the answers are short, we can we can deal with that. Um, it's, it's really to Atagi, but it's linked to the TGA. The TGA approved uh, the use of Pfizer for individuals 12 years and older on the 22nd of July. It then made its way to Atagi oh. as per usual, um, but Atagi made a decision to um, your, your original advice was um, to restrict it, I think, in early August to 12 to 15-year-olds with who had, were immunocompromised in some way. And then it wasn't until the 27th of August that you approved it for general use in children. So my question is, why in that in that age group did you split it to um, prior, first only um, support the provision of the vaccine to immunocompromised children uh, and then wait another essentially four weeks before it was approved for use in, in um, you know, the general 12 to 15 year old population. Um, Chris Blythe, uh, co-chair of uh, uh, TAGI, I'm happy to answer that, uh, Senator yep. Gallagher. Um, so our approach at that stage was based on what information we were gleaning from the international data and other uh, jurisdictions. Um, clearly, children with specific comorbidities are at greater risk of severe COVID, so they were our initial priority whilst we were waiting for the data at this stage. And once we had an opportunity to, re to review that data in its totality to understand the risks and benefits, we opened the program up for all adolescents, 12 to 15, um, at, at that stage uh, after those uh, uh, four weeks. Okay, but it, that was a different approach to how you've taken in the past for um, following TGA approval for other age cohorts? Well, for the 16 and above, I would say. Well, so Pfizer had been approved from 16 and above all the way along, and yeah. that was an early in the rollout strategy where the focus was on older people. Um, so, uh, you know, by definition, the, the strategy um, at that stage was focusing on that older age group when approval for the 12 to 15 year old group um, was given. We did due diligence on the data as far as looking at the benefits and, uh, and risks of vaccination in this age group. And clearly they differ in different 
populations within that. So the focus on those at greatest risk and then moving to all children, all so, adolescents, sorry. Okay, okay. I, I will come back to that to the department, but thank you for that. It was a question I had. Okay, so um, if everyone's happy for the TGA and um, ATAGI representatives, thank you for your appearance today and your evidence. It is greatly appreciated. It helps us with the work that we do. We thank you very much for making the time for us. Um, so you are free to leave and we'll welcome back um, General Fruin and um, the Department of Health. At, so we're six minutes behind. So shall we resume at 1.50? No. Oh, sorry, 12.50, 12.50, sorry. My apologies. Uh, the committee shall suspend until 12.50. Oh, awesome. Everyone, have we got people? Certainly we've got Department of Health back. I'll just see if we've got other senators online. Yep, great. Okay, uh, the committee will now resume its hearing into the COVID-19 pandemic and the Australian government's response to it. Uh, Senator Steele, John, are you ready to take the call? Yes, thanks, Chair. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, could I just return uh, briefly to the uh, figures you were able to give us general in relation to NDIS participants uh, before the break. Um, and could I clarify, when, we, when we're talking about percentage of the participant population, are we talking about the uh, entire NDIS participant population or uh, only the percentage that falls into the Doherty criteria? Um, what, what, are, what are we talking about there? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, sorry, uh, General Fruin, Coordinator General, COVID Vaccine Task Force. Um, Senator, my understanding is that it is all NDIS participants, but I'll just check with yes. Dr. Yep. That's a, sorry, was that, a, was that a yes? Yes, Senator. Yes, Senator, yes, Senator. Uh, yes, Senator. Lord, Deputy Coordinator General, yes, that is a yes. It started that we've actually identified um, through the Department of Social Services and the NDIA. All right. So that is that is uh, when we're talking about the rates currently, we're talking about forty-six percent of uh, of all of all NDIS participants are vaccinated. That's the. It's not all between the ages of sixteen and or up. Uh, no, it's it's all participants aged over sixteen. Ah, okay. All right. Yeah, so, eligible, uh, eligible population. Yeah. Eligible population. All right. Now. Uh, so, so what is that figure if we go kind of well and, and up? Did he say twelve? Twelve and up. up. Yep. Refer to James. James, do you, do you have that? So, uh, Senator James Hart, First Assistant Secretary, Disability and Aged Care Rollout. Um, yep. I can give you. I can give you two figures in relation to this. So. In terms of NDIS participants aged 12 to 15, 27.2% have received the first dose um, and 4.8% have received a second dose. And they are, um, as you might appreciate, they're lowish figures, but they're comparable with the general population. And I think there's been a, a great focus in terms of the, obviously the 12s and up. We can combine those two figures. The um, NDIS participants 12 to 15 and the NDIS participants 16 and over that General Fruin mentioned earlier, 59% mm -hmm. have had a first dose, 39.8% have had a second dose. 39. What was that first figure again? It was 39. 59.0, Senator. 59.0. Okay. And then the final, the final number would be because I'm thinking about the, you know, the overall. Uh, population and people can become NDIS participants before, uh, you know, when they're born. Um, and acknowledging that we don't, you know, we don't have a vaccine for yet for below the age of 12 that's that's on the books. But what is, uh, if you add the actual, you know, that, that zero to 12 cohort, what does that turn those figures into? Uh, I'd need to take that figure on notice, Senator. So we okay. normally report, um, so the reason we break it down that way is for com com comparability with the general population where I think as um, 
general fluency before we, we have that 16 and over and then the 12 to 15. So I can I can look at that on notice for you. All right. And if you add that, if you if you take the, the 12, if you do the thing of putting the 12 to 15 range into the border of Hopia, what's the figure for, for New South Wales and Victoria? Uh, just one moment, Senator. I'll have to get those figures on notice for you, Senator. So, what, so right. that is. So, can I just confirm um, if you're looking at 12 and over for New South Wales, what is yeah. that combined yeah. figure as per what I gave you for the entire participant population? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you could, yeah. And if, actually, since you're taking it on notice, Mr. Hart, I'd be curious to know uh, a, a kind of a state-based breakdown, if you can, territory and state breakdown for for all of that. Just so that we can get a, a picture in our minds of of the cohorts of the population that are able to act right now, where actually are we uh, across the different states and territory jurisdictions? Um, that that would be really good. But what you've told me so far is that if you add in the 12 to 15 cohort, the actual number of fully vaccinated at the moment is 39, and partially vaccinated is 59. Yep, 39.8 and 59.0. That's correct, Senator. Thank you. Um, all right, to two other cohorts. It might be still be with you, Mr. Hart, though. But I'm, I'm interested in the in the national figures for the for the prison population. Um, is anybody able to tell me what the vaccination rate is at the moment for the prison population? Uh, I get, I'd have to take that on notice, Senator. All right. Um, so anybody at the general's table, do you have that figure in terms of incarcerated persons? No, Senator, I don't have that. And I think we'd have to engage with the states and territories uh, to get much of that data. To get that. OK. Um, and are you able to give us any information as to uh, how the vaccination rate among homeless uh, people? Separately for homeless a, people. Um, Senator, sorry, uh, Tina Blue, Deputy Coordinator General, no, we do not have a separate figures for homeless people. We do have initiatives where we've been working with states and territories on the disadvantaged and hard to reach, and homeless people do fit into that actual strategy, but we do not have separate figures. Do you have a, can you give us an idea of how large you think that uh, disadvantaged and hard to reach cohort is? Um, I, I don't have that figure with me at the moment. Or, or how many? Or, or can you tell me anything about the about the rate of vaccination among that cohort? So the the disadvantage and hard to reach is sort of a mix. Um, Senator, you would probably be aware we have a plan for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. We have a plan for youth. We have a plan as we've just been recently talking about for the NDIS or people with dis disability and support workers. So we have a range of plans. More recently we've been very conscious of through our data analysis that there is the potential for pockets of vulnerability um, outside those groups, recognising they do cross over. So we have been meeting with the, the generals, had a number of meetings with uh, states and territories to talk through the strategy as to how states and territories are approaching uh, the disadvantaged and hard to reach groups. Um, each states and territory has identified a number of initiatives, but we are working with it because we do recognise the states and territories have a significant role to play in there. Um, given they've got their own uh, local strategies. But happy to take on notice to see if we can get some data for you, Senator. Yeah, oh, no, that would be that would be really useful uh, to, to know that if possible. Um, and Mr Hart, and then this is my last question, if you could give us um, the figure for um, the, the breakdown figure of uh, NDAS participants in that age range of, of 12 to 15, like uh, uh, broken down state by state, as well as increasing in the, in the overall uh, cohort, if that's possible. Because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get a picture of uh, what is the percentage, what is the vaccination rate among that 12 to 15 cohort? And then what does that subsequently do to the overall participant number? Uh, so if you're able to deliver that, we'll take definitely we'll take that on notice and see what we can do, Senator. 
But just so that I'm not taking away the wrong information at the moment, the rate among that cohort is 27% single dose, 4% Double dose. That's right. Twenty-seven point two yeah. and four point eight fully vaxxed. Yeah. Four point eight fully vaxxed, and then that the overall cohort picture into fifty-nine uh, partial vax, thirty-nine fully vax. Yeah. Twelve and over. That's X. correct. All right. Okay. Well, that'll do. And just, chair. Senator, just so you're clear with the numbers you're dealing with too, that the the national numbers at the moment, the way we are doing them is we're doing. 16 and above, so whenever we quote national rates, it's mm. 16 and above the eligible population, and then we're we're managing the 12 to 15 numbers separately. So I know there you're wanting to combine them, but we're not doing that with the national. I know you know. Yeah, yeah I, I I get you. I get you, General. That's fine. Okay, Chair. thank you, Senator Steele, Senator. John. Uh, Senator. Oh, Yes. Yes. Chair, sorry, sorry You're to interrupt right? you. Uh, the senator raised um, a question about boarding houses with me before the lunch. Sure. Yes. Would it be okay if yes. I came back on that now? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Thank you. Sorry for the interruption, Chair. Um, senator, the um, in terms of boarding houses, they are not captured um, in New South Wales and Victoria, and generally not captured as part of the two or more public accommodations. So. They're, they're not a figure that's reported on. And I think there is complexity in terms of, I think, the transients around that population as well. But I, I, just, I guess if I could reiterate, particularly in New South Wales, we have identified boarding houses as a cohort of particular interest, and we do have vaccination providers going there. And as a general principle, when we are actually, our providers are out doing vaccinations of um, people in uh, residential arrangements with a disability, we do ask and they look for opportunities to vaccinate people in boarding houses or similar type situations. But unfortunately, we don't have that captured as a data set as part of the residential accommodation. Um, Chair, can I ask a follow-up question to okay, that? Okay, just because I'm really nice and then I'm going to send a Keneally. <laughs> you, you are a lovely human being, thank you. Um, uh, so just to clarify, when General Fruin says in his opening statement that you've vaccinated, uh, the number is 75% uh, uh, of Andy I's participants have shared accommodation. Um, that is exclusionary of, that, that is excluding boarding houses. That doesn't typically include and people in boarding houses. How many people do you estimate are currly within is in, in New South Wales. Sorry, I just missed the end of that, Senator. How many folks does the department understand is within those settings in, in New South Wales? I'll, I'll have to give you that number on notice if that's okay. So I've got, we'll add that okay. to the things to right. add into. Yeah. And you. Senator, if I may just add, the, the issue of boarding houses has come up uh, in yeah. two ways with me and my consultations. Uh, in the planning we are doing around disadvantaged and hard to reach groups, which includes homeless, transients, uh, drug communities, uh, sex workers have been raised in their boarding houses mm -hmm. have been raised in that group of, you know, complex sort of subsets that we need to go yeah. after. But the disability advisory group have also raised this issue of boarding houses with us as well. So we are, we, we are aware of the, the people with disabilities who are in those houses, uh, just so they're not invisible to us. But I think the way you're talking about how the data is actually captured is something that we'll have to get more detail for you on. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Senator Steele, John, and thank you others. Can I go to Senator Keneally? Thank you very much. I have some questions about quarantine, please. Uh, the Prime Minister and the Tourism Minister both indicated the resumption of international travel could occur by Christmas. Uh, what role does health have in advising on the safety of the resumption of international travel? Professor Kelly, uh, <coughs> thank you for the question, Senator. Uh, we have a, a central role in, in advising the government on health matters uh, in general, um, obviously, and including uh, quarantine. Is your role limited to quarantine models or is it broader in terms of, uh, well, let me get into a couple questions then that might help uh, flesh out the questions I'm trying to ask you. Um, so has health advised the government or national cabinet on the appropriateness of the continued use of hotel quarantine? 
Uh, we've, we've provided um, <coughs> advice to, to National Cabinet and to our, our own Cabinet uh, along those lines, yes, of course, all the way through. Sorry, I mean in terms of throwing forward when the, uh, and this really piggybacks off some of the questions uh, Senator Patterson was asking earlier. Uh, if we throw forward to the reopening of the international borders, are you <laughs> providing advice or have, have you provided advice or has the government requested advice about the appropriateness of the continued use of hotel quarantine once the international borders reopen? Um, yes, so we, we have been asked and, and we have provided advice uh, as to the, throughout the whole plan, including what might happen at the border. And I sort of point out that uh, I think that's where you're going with this, is that there's more more to the border than, than hotel quarantine. There are various quarantine models that are being, um, and I mentioned this in the answer to the previous question, um, uh, are being uh, looked at now, the sort of formally trialled or piloted in New South Wales in South Australia and other states. Um, uh, so so that, that will help to inform what happens uh, in later stages of the plan. But the, the plan is very clear that, uh, that there will be a, a, an opening of the border uh, to a greater or lesser extent as we progress past 80% fully vaccinated. So has health advised on whether international visitors will be required to be fully vaccinated in order to travel to Australia? Uh, we've provided advice in relation to, to vaccination and other mitigation measures for people coming from, from other countries, yes. Uh, what advice have you provided on the recognition of vaccinations that are currently not registered in Australia for the purpose of travel? That is. Bluntly, will people be able to come here if they have a vaccination that's currently not uh, registered in Australia? So that's that's actually work that's being undertaken by the TGA at the moment, Senator. So I might have to take that on notice, given that um, um, uh, Professor Scarrett is no longer with us. Well, he is with us, but he's not. That's <laughs> 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 He was fine last time I saw him. <laughs> Right, so you are, that, that work is underway though. There, 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 there's a recognition there are vaccines that are not currently registered in Australia and we will have to make some decisions about how those will be um, managed or uh, accepted at the border. That's right. So the, 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 I think the, you know, the, the key, the, there's several points to that which I can sort of talk to, but you know, to get more detail we have to ask um, the TGA directly. But. Um, for, for, those, for Australians that are travelling overseas who have had a, a vaccination here in Australia, one of the three that's available now and registered with the TGA, that's easy. Um, they will have their, uh, their vaccine certificate through the AIR um, process and that's available and downloadable. Um, for those that have, have been overseas and have had one of the four vaccinations that have been registered in Australia, recognising that the Johnson & Johnson Janssen vaccine is not currently in use but has been registered. Um, that's relatively easy. There are, as you as you know, uh, a number of other vaccines uh, that have been used around the world and that's where it becomes a little trickier um, and the TGA is undergoing a process to, to really look at all of those others and I think they're well advanced with that work. Mm. Does, we might follow that up with them, uh, does health have a metric that will inform the facilitation of travel bubbles with other countries? For example, are they, is there a caseload, is it caseload dependent, vaccine percentage dependent? So, so this is work that's been uh, undertaken across government and we've been providing health input in, uh, into it, but it's really work that's being led from Home Affairs that's the, and, the, and the Australian Water Force. So um, I'm not really in a position to comment too much on that at the moment. It's a, it's, a current, it's currently under consideration by government. So are you saying Home Affairs has the lead on that? Uh, yes, in terms of in terms of the, the whole process of how people come across borders, that is that is Home Affairs that's in charge of that. Yes, but surely health has a role to play in advising whether or not a country has a sufficient vaccine level or has may have an outbreak underway and the risk that poses. Home Affairs is in a position to make those determinations. 
No, no, we're providing the health input into that, but the but the, the broader process of how people may or may not come across borders is, is a home affairs matter. Just in relation to that, up to now, we have had, uh, uh, right throughout the pandemic, uh, a well-developed um, country risk assessment approach, which we've done for not every country in the world, but for most countries, and certainly with the, for those that have had a high case load, um, we've, we've, we've acknowledged that and then worked uh, closely with other other parts of, of government to, to look at which which countries are of greater interest um, uh, in terms of where people are travelling from and, and so forth. Uh, and we've gone into great detail about um, the health system there as well as their caseload um, previously and, and going forward their ability to, to test um, uh, at, the, at their own border uh, to do surveillance of, within their own country um, and, and how that translates to people coming uh, to Australia. So that's been part of the process throughout. We're looking to really um, streamline that into the once we have those high rates of vaccination in the community um, and that will be part of that work that I mentioned previously. Just going back to some of the consideration, and I'm just trying to understand the, the considered in terms of decision making, consideration around quarantine arrangements. Will the origin of international visitors play a role in determining what quarantine arrangement is available to them? Um, so that's certainly part of the process at the moment, and the, the, the future of that will be a decision of government, and it's, uh, it's undergoing that, that process of working through that uh, right now. We're providing health input into that wider piece, um, and, uh, and you know, it's, it's in the plan that there will be changes at the border, and, um, and the Prime Minister himself has made several announcements about that, what, what that might look like by the end of the year, and so um, that's the process we're going through now. I note that um, the Premier in New South Wales, Gladys Berejiklian, has made some um, observations about wanting to see the whole country open up together. And, you know, I'm trying to understand the extent to which decisions about international arrival caps and quarantine options will be taken by individual states or will be taken by the Australian government, which does have responsibility for managing the international border. Uh, so, as it's been pointed out many times, Senator, we would, would say that there is a shared responsibility in relation to quarantine and the international border, not so much the international border itself, but as soon as someone steps into New South Wales, of course, it, uh, it is the New South Wales authorities that need to make decisions about what happens to them and the same in other states. Uh, so, there is, a, there is, National Cabinet has, has agreed that there will be this process of uh, of the, the four phase plan, and there is parts of that that refer specifically to international arrivals. Um, how that actually plays out into, into the future will will remain to be seen, but there is certainly a commitment to look uh, at the border and the border arrangements. In terms of what happens in quarantine in particular states, that does still remain um, uh, within their purview to, to take different, different approaches. Uh, and we've still have, as you know, a number of domestic borders that are that is currently shut, so that does add a a, a degree of complexity. Mm. Mm. That's quite interesting. The idea that we might have international arrivals meeting different sets of quarantine requirements or obligations depending on which airport they choose to arrive. Is that what I'm understanding that correctly? That could be an outcome here. Well, that, that remains to be remains to be seen, but I think it's it's quite clear that there are that the there are different there are states and territories within Australia with a very different way uh, to way out of where we are now into living with COVID. Um, there's the states with no cases, and there's the states which are currently experiencing lockdown with with uh, a significant community transmission. So. Uh, that, is, that is, of course, um, guiding how people, are, how those state and territory governments are, are seeing their way, for, way forward, and um, that will be part of the discussion of the national picture. But in the end, though, though, there will be an element of state and territory decision making. Mm. So, does that mean things like if people are able to home quarantine, that will be left to states and territories to manage and verify? Uh, so, as, as I said, it's a, a live uh, discussion in, in government at the moment for what what the what modified alternative quarantine might look like when we get to the 70 and 80 percent, particularly 80 percent and beyond 
um, uh, that's that part of, of, of the plan which is uh, which is most pertinent to that that question. Um, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm 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 definitely of a view that there will be changes in, in relation to that. There are. Um, uh, pilot programs happening in, in a couple of states, as mentioned, and, and indeed home quarantine has been uh, part of the process uh, throughout, particularly here in, in the ACT. They have uh, a lot of experience in relation to home quarantine very safely. Hmm. Um, what about returning Australians from overseas, either the ones who are stranded or ones who uh, do choose to go overseas once the border opens? If they're fully vaccinated, do, does health have a view or have they provided advice as to whether or not they should be able to access home quarantine? Um, so th there has certainly been a lot of discussion about vaccination and uh, that's been in the public domain as well about, about um, so-called vaccination passports and, uh, and how, how that can be proved. Um, it comes goes back to the answer I gave earlier, Senator, about uh, that's relatively easy to do when someone is, has been vaccinated here and the, uh, it's now compulsory that that, um, uh, that information is added to the Australian Immunisation Register. So there's a, a digital certificate potential there for, for vaccination. It becomes a little bit more uh, difficult for people that are vaccinated overseas, but it's not impossible. Um, but as I said, that, that's, that's a live discussion of, uh, in government at the moment about how that might play out into the future, so I'm not in a position to give too much detail at the moment. Mm. Mm. Um, so look, I, I don't mean to be um, disrespectful, but it does seem like there are a lot of questions that still remain to be answered, uh, even though there's some discussion of the international border reopening by Christmas. Is there a timeline for some of these decisions? Uh, yes, as I say, there are live considerations at the uh, in the Commonwealth government and uh, and at national cabinet in relation to those matters. And so, um, very soon there'll be more to say about it. Mm. I'm just imagining with some 36,000 stranded Australians who'd like to come home, the whole lot of Australians, including my good self, that would like to go visit our parents who live overseas. Uh, it does seem to me that we will be in a circumstance potentially where there are, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of Australians who are wanting to come back into the country. Others, such as international students and skilled workers, who want to come into the country. You know, it would seem to me our hotel quarantine system is certainly not fit for purpose for that volume of people. Um, I am alarmed to hear that there might be different. Uh, there would, there may not be a cons nationally consistent approach to quarantine. Um, Senator, I think, can I just yep. add in, I think National Cabinet is quite keen to get national consistency on this. I think what Professor Kelly is saying is that just may be a period if different states are in different uh, outbreak situations. For example, uh, a state like Western Australia has no cases may have a a different risk approach until they do have, until they are living with COVID to a, to a state that is already living with COVID. So there may be a transitional period where states are a little bit different, but National Cabinet is working very hard to try and get consistent approaches to, you know, uh, the quarantine treatment of returning vaccinated travellers, the allowing uh, vaccinated travellers to travel, all those things are being worked through very actively at the moment. And as Professor Kelly said, I think there will be uh, more to say in coming weeks about that, but I think I think the aim is very much to get national consistency, and that should be achieved pretty soon. But it just may be that a transitional period where the risk appetite is a little different in some states. Thank you, um, Chair. If it's all right, I have two more uh, okay. questions. Sure. Yep. Um, or I might turn it to one since. I <laughs> um, if I can uh, ask. I'll ask one then. Um, if I can ask uh, on a different question, uh, which uh, agency and government would have the lead on countering disinformation about uh, vaccines? So do you want me? 
Senator Tina Fluor, Deputy Coordinator General of the, from the um, Vaccine Task Force. That would be uh, Department of Home Affairs. They have a unit that's set up in there that actually is responsible for general um, misinformation. Uh, and they meet with the task force uh, once a fortnight. They've been meeting with us over the last um, number of, or about the last six weeks, I think, off the top of my head, to share that particular information. Mm, they have a web page, I know, uh, Department of Home Affairs. Uh, just in light of the um, protests that we have seen in Melbourne in recent days, uh, the, the, the warnings that have come from uh, ASIO and AFP, the way in which uh, far-right extremist groups are using the pandemic to spread disinformation, has there been any, have there been any steps since the protests? Um, has the government taken any additional steps since the protests erupted in Melbourne? Uh, to uh, its efforts to counter disinformation about the vaccine? Um, Senator, that would have to be referred to the Department of Home Affairs. So while they give us general information, as they share around talking, you know, or, um, what they've been dealing with on social media uh, and that sort of thing, we, they don't share actual data with us. I do know that they obviously have a role in working with the particular agencies that are responsible for that, but. Yeah, it's, it's something you would have to refer to the Department of Home Affairs. All right, thank you. Chair, if you don't mind, I will ask one more question. Um, uh, earlier we discussed uh, that the, the uh, decisions around phase 1A uh, and the, um, I think your words were, uh, I think uh, Professor um, Murphy's words were that there had been a quote, stronger focus on aged care uh, than disability and said that in hindsight, uh, perhaps pe people with a disability could have been advised earlier that that uh, focus had changed. Um, I just wanted to ask, are there any other groups uh, where you have, in, in the rollout of this vaccine, where you have taken a stronger focus or to borrow the words of the Disability Royal Commission, deprioritized or reprioritized groups within either within the phases or indeed move groups between phases. And I ask this because it was this committee that got this information last time regarding disability and I want to know if there are any other reprioritizations or changes in focus in the vaccine rollout. So Senator, and again I I don't accept that it was a, re, a deprioritization, but the refocusing on residential aged care for that in-reach uh, workforce did also impact on the residential aged care workers who were originally going to be, uh, but that was also uh, due to the vaccine difficulties. We took advice from ATAGI that it wasn't possible to do the workers and the residents at the same time um, because of the issues with uh, um, using the, but there was experience from the USA where doing the workers and the residents at the same time uh, was not ideal because they were seeing lots of uh, people having sick days. So we decided to separate the uh, workers from the residents, but the workers were also uh, having in reach provision. And that again was done later in the piece than the residents because the residents were the higher priority. But as you know, we. We now have probably the world's best vaccination rate for residential aged care workforce uh, because of a very strong priority in recent months with sort of 99% of them vaccinated. So, so that, 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 that focus on residential aged care meant that that workforce who were doing originally residential disability workers and residents and residential aged care residents and workers focused on the residential aged care residents as the highest priority. But there has been there have been no other reprioritizations or changes of. Uh, not not that I'm aware of, uh, unless General Fruin wants to comment. So, as a senator, we had to uh, put in place some very intensive programs to reach the 100% uh, vaccination target for aged care workers by the 17th of September. Uh, so we we certainly gave. Uh, highest priority of effort to achieving that task at that point in time, but did continue uh, with all of the other uh, priority groups and work in those areas. 
Right now, I am giving a weighting of effort to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander rollout because of the, the significant gap that exists there between their first and second dose vaccination rates at the moment, uh, trying to uh, bring those vaccination rates up as quickly as we can. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Thank you. Keneally. Can I go to Senator Davey? Uh, thank you. And uh, Professor Murphy, I want to come back to the question of some of the um, various uh, versions of information that are going around and um, uh, possibly contributing to vaccine hesitancy for um, for people who otherwise, or you know, uh, would normally uh, not question vaccines, but for some reason uh, during COVID, um, they are. I, I just, I'm constantly getting uh, letters and emails through to my office saying COVID's just another version of the flu. Although I note the flu people get vaccinated against and they go back every year and get a new vaccination because uh, it's like a, a flu booster. But how does COVID actually compare to the flu when it comes to um, fatality rates uh, and, and the like? I'll get Professor Kelly to answer that, Senator. Um, thank you, Senator, for the for the question. So um, that the, we know that that uh, the COVID, when it uh, when it first hit last year, we had a um, uh, and and this is still the case in many parts of the world where vaccination. The vaccination rollout hasn't been as successful and widespread as it has here. Um, uh, that it does, it is, it is has a much higher uh, mortality rate, particularly in people that are vulnerable to COVID. So, uh, and particularly in the elderly, as well as other people with chronic disease. Um, so, last year it, it was not a good comparison uh, between COVID and the flu. Now, with vaccination as it's rolled out, actually, and I made um, a reference to the to the change in mortality rate specifically last year compared with this year, um, that comparison is actually a reasonable one. Um, we know that in a, in a flu season, um, and uh, we do get flu all throughout the year, but it's mostly in winter. Um, in a bad year, for example, in, two, in 2017, we had 201,446 cases of flu notified in Australia. That was almost certainly a, an underestimate of the actual number, so it would have been much, it would, could have been higher than that. And we had 959 deaths, uh, so that's a mortality rate of 0.48%. Um, this year so far, you know, every death is is very regrettable, but um, uh, and this this is a, a comparison I made last last month uh, up till the 15th of September. Um, uh, we had uh, the mortality rate was 0.42 percent for COVID in, 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 in Australia. So and what 0. 4, was the mortality 0. rate last year, sorry? Um, the mortality rate last year was 3.2%, uh, um, but this year 0.42%, um, uh, which is very similar to the a, a bad flu year. Um, the five-year average for influenza mortality is, is, is a little bit lower than that, but it's in that same ballpark, uh, a, bit under, uh, a bit under half a percent. I think Sorry, the point, um, Senator, is that uh, at Professor Kelly is saying that unvaccinated COVID is a very serious disease. So these people who are portraying that it is a mild disease without vaccination, it is not. Uh, and if you are an older person, over 70, you, you know, you have quite a high mortality rate. Mm -hmm. And so, so there is very significant misinformation to say that COVID uh, is just like the flu in an unvaccinated population. What Professor Kelly is saying is because we've been now so successful in our vaccination program, we are now starting to see a mortality rate that's similar to the flu. But that's because we're vaccinated. And what about um, comparisons? And I know the mRNA and the flu shot are different technologies, but um, but the comparisons of the need to, with a flu shot, you go in annually to get your flu your flu shot, and that gives you uh, some protection against the most serious symptoms of the disease. Um, but you, you do have to have that sort of annual. I don't. I don't think we call it a booster for flu shots, but an annual shot. 
What do we see the future of the COVID vaccination regime? In I've been having significant discussions with experts and just in coming days on this issue. The answer is we probably don't know. Uh, we, we do know that these COVID vaccines are remarkably more effective at, at preventing severe disease and probably preventing transmission than the flu vaccines. They are very effective vaccines. Um, we don't know, we do know that the humoral immunity or the antibody levels in people do fall over time, but the protection against severe disease remains strong. Um, it is, uh, there are some people who are definitely will need a third dose if they're immune compromised. As, you, as you're aware, there are, some, there are some parts of the world that because of those falling antibody levels are proposing boosters in the more vulnerable cohorts. It may well, it, it's probably likely we will have boosters for uh, potentially at least for the first couple of years maybe, but we do not know after that whether this disease um, may then just become background endemic and not need boosters except perhaps for a particular small group of the population. We don't know yet whether it will require an annual uh, booster program like flu. The antigenic variation of the virus is not the same as flu, which changes very rapidly. So we have planned for boosters. We've bought enough vaccines for boosters for, uh, more than enough vaccines for boosters for next year and boosters for the year after. But we are waiting the expert advice and ATAGI are still considering their position on the need for and the populations who may be offered boosters. So it's an evolving space and we will be, we, we said we don't know yet what the efficacy of a third dose of an mRNA vaccine might be. A lot of questions uh, to be answered. So it's an unknown area. I don't know whether Professor Kelly wants to add anything more. No, I think that's a good summary. Thanks. So um, you said a target you're looking at it. Can you just talk us through the process? Are TGA involved in this, in the boost? T the TGA are also involved. Um, uh, in and the companies will make are making submissions. Uh, Pfizer will be making a submission, uh, we believe, in October uh, to have their vaccine registered as a booster. Uh, and TJ will look at the data about safety and potential efficacy. But then the the programmatic recommendations uh, will depend on a target advice. So as all of most of these vaccine decisions are. A combination of the TGA registration decisions and then the experts in vaccination from ATAGI about who should get a booster, when and how many times and how often. And uh, you did say before um, that we've got enough doses on order for we have boosters? A, we have um, 60, 65 million fires are coming next year. We've got 51 million Novavax and we've got another 15 million Moderna. We've got, we have ample redundancy of uh, vaccines for boosters and also to be able to supply boosters if they're required to our Pacific neighbours and other countries. We have a very significant redundant supply. Right, thank you. That's all from me, Chair. Thank you, Senator Davey. Um, I'm gonna take the call now, but I understand Senator Keneally has just a couple of questions. Senator Keneally, it might be more convenient if you would like to do that now. Sure, Chair, thank you. Um, this, uh, my question harkens back to a, a previous hearing where I uh, asked about, um, I asked if the department had uh, vaccine supply figures broken down by primary health network. And we had a, a fair bit of discussion about allocation to GPs. Uh, what we didn't get uh, was, I didn't get was a clear answer to that question. Uh, does the department have supply figures by primary health report? Jennifer? Yeah, Jennifer, you want to go? Senator, yes, we do. And What's your particular interest? Uh, well, my particular interest would be in Greater Sydney, but that is because I'm a senator for New South Wales. I imagine the committee yep. would be very interested, though, 
in those uh, figures. Is it possible that they could be supplied on notice, please, to the committee? Yes, Hi, yes. Sure. yes, Senator. Yes. And, and you're just interested in what's going through primary care in each state and territory? Yes. I'm trying to understand, I'm, I'm trying to get a, a window, if you will, on the allocation of vaccines by primary health network. So the previous question I asked was about concern, that reflected concerns I'd received from GPs in Western Sydney uh, regarding the process for allocating supply. Uh, we had a fairly um, broad conversation Somehow it seems that um, my question did not get taken on notice. So I'm asking, do you have supply volume figures by primary health network that could be supplied to the committee? Yeah, Dr. De, De Topper is the expert in primary care allocation. Do you want to address that? Uh, thank you, Dr. Murphy. Senator Keneally. Uh, Dr. Lucas Otoka, First Citizen Secretary, Program Implementation and Primary Care Response in the National COVID Vaccine Task Force of Health. Um, uh, Sorry we didn't get that uh, question as a question on notice. We uh, can provide allocations across, the, across primary care as a channel, and that is reflected in the National Allocations Document. General Fruin uh, published the latest version of last Friday. In terms of allocations in each of the primary health network regions, uh, we will have to take that on, on notice. Uh, but as a general allocation principle, we have looked at per capita equity also at a PHN level. Whenever GPs have been have been transitioned to Pfizer um, in the in a gradual process over the last couple of months. We looked at what areas were most most at need in terms of uh, their uh, ratio of access to Pfizer doses per eligible population was lower, and we prioritised those uh, in terms of the GPs that were coming on board first. Uh, up until now, where every GP that has put their hand up to. Uh, uh, administer the Pfizer vaccine is being onboarded into the program. But we, we can provide um, on notice allocations per PHN region. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Keneally. OK, I have um, some questions on the national plan and um, in particular the hospital capability. Um, so I think that'll be to you, Professor Murphy and others working on that. Um, and just note, we have asked for these documents. Um, they've been referred by Professor Murphy to uh, the Health Minister for a public interest immunity claim. I would just say that in doing that, it would be very useful if the Minister um, explained the public harm that would come from releasing this information, which is actually the test to to withhold information from a Senate committee, and I'd be interested to know what the public harm from not telling the public what the state of their hospitals are going to be under an opening up situation actually is. But in the light of the fact that you're not going to be providing it, can I ask um, how many ICU beds there are available for COVID-19 patients? across the country. I think there's 6,000 ICU beds, that's my understanding. How many of those, as part of the analysis you've done, are available for patients who might be positive for COVID-19? So, Senator, each of the states and territories is finalising their plans at the moment for living with COVID and yep. uh, and for surge planning. And they have, they're working sort of iteratively uh, with the uh, Department of Health and uh, Dr. Sonia Bennett, who's leading that work. And so they are currently refining those plans to work out what they would see as a living with COVID ICU uh, capacity and a surge capacity. And the, the two, the two are quite different, and we, at the moment we are refining uh, all of all of those uh, documents, and they're coming again to national cabinet with the with the current iterations of those documents. You're right to say that when we when we started off the pandemic, we had what we called a, a sort of a crisis surge plan that was over 6,000 ICU beds. Um, that uh, that and we purchased ventilators sufficient 
uh, to service that. I think the, the <coughs> excuse me, the sense at the moment is that that would be um, not something that could be sustained for more than a, a serious crisis, which was not something we will now contemplate in our vaccinated population. So a surge planning is planning for significantly uh, less of, of an ICU capacity for that. So at the moment, the um, the, the ANZIC uh, Intensive Care Society is also doing some planning on that work, and uh, they have identified that there are currently, I think, a little over 2,000 beds currently open. There are 500 beds that are, that are staff able to be staffed and open immediately, and their expansion capacity uh, for, I'll just get the exact numbers, um, from the ANZIC strategy for uh, at least another 2,000 beds, if I can just um, find that in my notes. Um, but I would say that uh, um, the, the important thing is that the jurisdictions are, are now doing significant additional work um, to refine what they would see as, as able to be staffed in that additional capacity and so uh, I think we will be coming out from National Cabinet with a much clearer picture on, on that and the surge capacity is very different as I said from the from the living with COVID capacity so uh, we, once we've once we've got the jurisdictions to finally agree on on what they would see as a realistic surge and a realistic living with COVID capacity we'll be able to provide that information and I think you're absolutely right. The public has a right to know uh, what 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 is planned for in the opening up strategy, and we can certainly provide that once once national cabinet has uh, considered it and and assess the realistic nature of those projections. Okay. Um, uh, so, <laughs> it's a lot of words there, <coughs> Professor Murphy. What you're saying is, what we've got two thousand beds. Which would to, about to, to, which yeah, could grow to five hundred pretty by five hundred pretty quickly, and then an additional yeah, two thousand that could be commissioned mm -hmm. if required. Yeah. Uh, immediately, that was that was the assessment by ANZIX, um, and uh, again the states and territories have not uh, signed off fully on that yet because they're doing their own local planning and particularly looking at the workforce availability to see yeah. how quickly they can stand up those expansions. The extra 500, the staff are there at the moment, they okay. can be stood up. And they're intensive, no are they intensive care beds? Correct. Okay. And so what about other hospital um, capacity? Because not everyone who goes to hospital needs intensive care. So what, what are the plans and again, there? Again, Again, that's the work that's that's being discussed at, uh, through all the jurisdictions, and will be taken has been taken progressively to national okay. cabinet, and the jurisdictions are finalising their numbers. But clearly, that that is a much larger number than the ICU beds that are available. But, sure. but again, there's a difference between living with COVID, which is a situation that we hope to be in, where we can continue to provide ordinary health services, uh, continue. To, to do elective surgery, continue to do those things that we would we would normally do, um, and and not paralyse the health system. But then there is also a scenario when uh, there might be a surge that was unexpected, such as we've seen in New South Wales uh, yeah. recently, where where they uh, clearly the rest of the health system is under pressure. So both those scenarios are being refined and planned. And to give you exact numbers, we'll, we need, we want the states and territories okay. to own those numbers and they're still finalising them. How, I mean, my question then is, how can you agree to the national plan to transition from A to B to C and then to D without having line of sight on what it means for your hospitals? I mean, it would seem to me that this is pretty late. You've already agreed to a transition plan and now you're doing the work to understand what that might mean for the hospitals? We're, we're, we're finalising that work. That work's been going okay. on for several weeks and I think National Cabinet will be again looking at the finalisation of that and the Premiers have been very clear that they're, 
that their support for the national plan is conditional upon them being assured that they do have sufficient health system capacity. Okay. And that's why we're working closely with them to get the final data okay. to them. Well, then how can the Prime Minister um, be pushing the national plan if he doesn't know what the hospital capability is? Well, he, he has seen high level aggregated data, which we have provided, okay. which shows that well, can you provide that to the committee? Can you provide that? that is, we, we will, as I said to you, Senator, National Cabinet will likely release, uh, I imagine, it's been their, in their practice, obviously, decision for the Premiers and the Prime Minister, modelling data once they've finally, once they've considered it. I'm not privy to the decision about the timing of that, but I think there will clearly be in the interest to get some of that modelling information into the public domain. Okay. So have you, have you been in a position to assure the Prime Minister that the hospital capacity, the hospital system will, I think, be resilient or be able to accommodate a move to um, particularly phase B of the national rollout? Because I imagine that's going to be where the rubber hits the road. Yes, Senator. So the, model, all the data that we've seen, the modelling we've done, the aggregate modelling by the Doherty shows that uh, we believe that this hospital system at a gross level is there. But as I said, the states and territories are keen to get individual state-based modelling, which they're, yeah. which they're all... They're but I'm asking about, about your analysis, um, my, uh, Professor my analysis Murphy, because it, in the media reports it says you had conducted analysis. I presume that's been provided to the Prime Minister. Um, and based on what you know, can you guarantee Australians that moving to phase B, the hospital system will cope? That, on the data that I have, yes, that's the advice we've provided the Prime okay. Minister. It's important, important right. to note, though, that in phase B, uh, there are a range of mitigations that, that yep. can be put in place I as understand necessary. That. Um, and what would be the bed occupancy across the hospital at phase B that you're aware of? Well, again, Senator, we, we, we're we refining those information on the Living with COVID strategy. So we're, we are talking about uh, a plan to live with COVID where most of the people are being managed in the community, mm -hmm. uh, in community care, and there are models of care being developed, models of primary care. I've just been through it myself, Professor Murphy, so I'm aware yes, of I, that. I under yeah. understand that, and we have great sympathy for you for, <laughs> for okay. that. That's OK. I don't um, need the sympathy, yeah. but I, I have a good line of sight on what's happening in the community. Mm -hmm. so, 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 so the plans are... Uh, to, and, I, and I, I don't want to give exact numbers until the states and territories are happy with their own individual numbers, but at an aggregate level, we, we, have, we are comfortable that with the various mitigations that are proposed in phase B, with the ability to tailor the testing, tracing and quarantine and the public health and social measures, that at that vaccination rate, we, 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 sh we will be able to uh, control outbreaks. And we are already seeing evidence of that uh, in New South Wales. Okay. So do you, have you provided a figure around bed occupancy to um, the government as we move we have, uh, under the national plan? Because it is pretty provide, important. I, I mean, we have provided, yes, certainly, Senator, we've just, provided aggregate bed, uh, likely bed occupancy, but this, that's being refined at a state and territory can level. I, okay. Well, I'm asking what is the likely bed occupancy? that you have provided. I'm not asking about the stuff the states and territories are refining. I'd like to know what what is that figure that you have provided to the government? Well, that, that, that's been part of the National Cabinet considerations oh. at the moment, and uh, we, will, we can take that on notice. Professor Murphy, so you're not going to tell me how full the hospital is going to be under um, phase B? Uh, Senator, we, the plan is to have phase B in the living with COVID uh, uh, plans is to have relatively low COVID occupancy of the beds such that the rest of the health system can maintain and that's what the modelling is doing but we we're refining that modelling with each of the states and territories wants to be able to reality check that at a state level before we communicate it publicly it's still under national cabinet consideration. Um, so is it above 90 percent? 
Certainly not, Senator. Living with COVID would not be anywhere near that level of occupancy. We'd be talking at the other end of the spectrum for living with COVID. In terms of bed occupancy at the hospital? Uh, a bed I'm not saying 90 per cent of COVID being in the hospital. Oh, no. I'm asking what the bed occupancy is. Because once it gets above 90 per cent, the hospital is stressed. And I'm trying to understand sure. what the figure well, is. I think and again, I, I, I can't give you an exact figure that will depend on each state, but, I, but there's no question that the states have, uh, uh, there's a fair bit of demand at the moment, and, one of, and some of their living with COVID plans do envisage creating some extra capacity, but uh, I would expect there will be high occupancy when we live with COVID as there is even in those states that don't have COVID at the moment. We certainly do have a lot of demand, and that's been one of the challenges in planning this living with COVID scenario is to work out what additional capacity the states and territories might need to bring online to be able to be comfortably able to live with COVID. Okay, so we're pushing, when, when is your, um, again, your advice on when we would move to um, phase B? I think we had well, a date that, earlier across, so when do we get to, what's your best well, um, date that you're that working to? General Fruin might be able to give a prediction about when we nationally will hit the 70% uh, fully vaxxed target, which is the trigger for phase B. So I, I did give these numbers yeah. earlier yeah. today. Just, uh, yeah. yeah. The, the estimate for 70% nationally, um, given that I said these are estimates with variables yeah. including human okay. motivations, so we're talking uh, the last week of October is where we think nationally we can get to 70% second dose. Okay. Thanks, um, General. So we're, we're a month away from essentially shifting to option B. When will we find out what the hospital capability is? Well, National Cabinet is having, uh, I think it's been in public domain, National Cabinet's been discussing that uh, on its last two meetings and it will be discussing it again at its meeting this Friday and I would hope pretty soon, Senator. Mm, pretty soon, okay. Well, I, I, can't, I can't direct National Cabinet to... I'm not asking to you make... to direct it, but you're also not asking direct question, answering direct questions. I'm asking you about your state of knowledge based on the fact it's going to National Cabinet. So, um, you know, I can keep going one by one through these questions that I have. Um, <laughs> What about deferred health care? Is that part of option B as well, that we are going to be delaying um, you know, elective surgery or less urgent elective surgery, outpatient no, clinics, all those kinds of things? No, Senator, that's the plan. The Living with COVID plan envisages that we continue normal health system activity, including elective surgery. Um, and that's been quite an important part of the uh, the, the contingency planning in the states and territories and the private sector will be continuing its private elective surgery, the public sector will continue public elective surgery. The idea for many states is to identify specified uh, wards or even sometimes hospitals that might take COVID patients so that there isn't a, an impact on the rest of the system. So that's, that's the planning that the states are okay. doing. But it's, we all accept that it's important not to not to uh, significantly defer ordinary health system activity. Well, I think it's already really happening in practice from what, what we hear. I mean, from other evidence from the AMA last week, I mean, they were saying that's already happening. It's, it's private, so private hospitals, using private hospitals as part of the opening up hospital strategy is part of it, according... No, only, only for the surge uh, contingency plans. That's always been part of our... Uh, contingency plans and that they have been used in the New South Wales outbreak but the living with COVID plans which is the way we anticipate those states that don't have cases will transition does not envisage using private hospitals it envisages okay. using uh, only public sector facilities. And I've, I've sort of asked this before but how could you agree to a national plan to transition to without having an understanding of the impact on the hospital, like well, not think... not, I'm, I'm, because to me it seems the whole reason we're in lockdowns and all of that is because we're trying to protect our hospital system. Ultimately, that's 
That's really the focus of a lot of the lockdowns is to manage the scarce resources that hospitals have to look after people with serious illness, particularly when we've had low vaccination rates. So how could you put together a national plan to transition to um, you know, living with COVID without understanding completely what the impact that would have on your hospitals? It just well, seems to we, be we're doing a bit this this bit a bit late. No, we, we as I've said, Senator, we've been monitoring hospital capacity right throughout the pandemic, and that's been reported to national cabinet. And the national plan uh, discussions have been informed by our assessment and the Doherty's assessment, and we are we are confident that we have the hospital capacity. But the the states and territories, as I've said, want to have have it refined at their own jurisdictional level, and that's the work that's being done now. But at an aggregate level, we, we are confident that the national plan is able to be de delivered within the available hospital capacity. Going to the community um, side of things, uh, under the opening up and under the modelling, um, there will be more cases of COVID, and so more people looking after sick people at home. The AMA appeared last week. Their recommendation is that there be a national um, response to the delivery of primary, essentially primary health care um, through um, you know, people being at home and have a designated item for GPs to support that. Is the government working with the AMA on that or looking at that? Absolutely, Senator. We've got a, a team in the department that's working on the primary care strategy, which, uh, and that again will be fed back to National Cabinet uh, as part of the health system capacity work. So we are actively working uh, on that plan and we'll be engaging all the relevant stakeholders, the College of GPs, the AMA, the primary health networks, our GP respiratory clinics, and all of the primary care settings, because that will be an important part of the response. Okay. Because the AMA said last week they hadn't been consulted on any plans for under the opening up strategy for community care of people, of patients? This work's ongoing and they certainly will be consulted. Okay. And does the Commonwealth take responsibility for um, community care of COVID-19 patients under the um, responsibilities of primary care or is that a state matter? It's, it's a partnership again, Senator, is because uh, many... Many of, it is. Many of the states have hospital on the home strategies, and again, this whole all this hospital capacity work is a partnership. We've had a, a large uh, national working group that uh, is chaired by one of Paul uh, Kelly's deputy CMOs, and working with senior officials in each state and territory on all the hospital capacity and the primary care work, and it's a shared responsibility. They have hospital on the home where they provide their staff. We have GPs and primary cares and primary health networks, and we are working uh, on a coordinated model of community care. Um, and are you happy with the level of community care that's being provided to um, COVID positive patients in the community now? I mean, do you have any line of sight on that, on how it's been delivered and the outcomes and how well people feel supported? I, I think it's, it's, it's fair to say that uh, it's, it's well developed in Victoria and New South Wales, I think, have had to develop a community care model fairly quickly given their outbreak and they've, they've done a lot of work on that now. I think there are lessons that we are learning from the New South Wales experience and also the Victorian experience, which we will be feeding into the primary care plan. But I think it, it is there are some very good elements of what's been done in Victoria and New South Wales and uh, to some extent in the ACT, to a lesser extent, but I think there is, there is clearly room for improvement and we want to make sure that we have the best model of care before we transition out. Because if we have, the, under the opening up, thousands of new cases, potentially, across Australia, and many of those are in the community, that's, you know, thousands of little community hospitals that are being run by untrained people. Um, does the Commonwealth have a role there um, to support oh, those households? Yeah. I'm trying to understand whether we're ready. It seems very late if we're just doing the hospital work and we're still consulting on community care when we're facing opening up in just under a few weeks. I mean, are we ready for what's going to happen and are people ready? Do, they have, do we have any understanding of how this is going to roll out across the community? Because I can say, having I just been through it, I was completely 
unprepared for what hit my house and I am worried that we are going to have thousands of families in the same situation as me completely unprepared for what's coming their way because nobody Senator, seems to be able to tell us. Senator, there is considerable planning done in every jurisdiction and there's work that we're doing uh, both at the hospital level and the primary care level. We are very confident that the systems will be there to support it. We're not anticipating thousands of cases. Um, we're anticipating that with a highly vaccinated population and the right public health and social measures, the the outbreaks will be controlled and low level and able to be managed. That's the, that's the whole essence of a national plan. We're not expecting and nor are we um, anticipating uh, outbreaks of the scale that we've seen in New South Wales recently. That is not the national plan. The national plan is for those states that don't have COVID and for, the, uh, and for those states like New South Wales and Victoria and ACT who are controlling their current outbreak to, to get the situation into a controlled situation where case numbers are relatively low, hosp hospitalisations are low, and the, and the numbers of patients in the community can be well cared for by the services that are there. So you think by the last week of October, which is sort of when we notionally moving towards um, phase B, that you would you will have the work around hospital capability well complete and hopefully published, and and um, community care plans finalised. That that that's certainly my belief, Senator. Yes. Um, is it a commitment from government that that would be in place before we move to phase B, or is it potentially that we move to phase B while this work is still being um, national undertaken? Cabinet, national, cabinet, national Cabinet has made it very clear that it wants reassurance on all these me measures as it progresses through the National Plan. This will be a big discussion, I think, at our next National Cabinet meeting. OK. Um, on boosters, what's the time frame for the decisions on boosters? I listened to your answers to um, Senator Davey. Um, you said you're going to have some discussions, but what is what is the time frame you're working towards on that? Well, that, that would depend on the ATAGI process. It's ATAGI are still analysing the evidence on boosters. Um, uh, different countries have made different uh, approaches to boosters. Uh, the evidence is still emerging. So obviously there's a TGA process that is a regulatory decision, but then the decision about whether we, where, whether, when and to whom we give boosters will, is, is dependent on ongoing ATAGI consideration. They don't feel that the evidence is there for them to make a definitive position at the moment. Uh, if they were still here, I could get them to talk to that, but uh, that they are reviewing that every week and reviewing the evidence and the experience from uh, countries around the world that have started booster programs. Okay. Um, perhaps we were too um, quick to let them go um, because I think in some other countries, the boosters are kicking in at about the six month mark. And I would imagine for some of our vulnerable cohorts who may be eligible or who may warrant a booster, for some of them, that time frame will be co is coming up reasonably quickly. For those that got vaccinated in, you know, late late February, March, and April, um, we would be nearing that time frame now. And it's hard to get cognizant of that. Some countries have made an eight month gap. Um, other countries, there there is a lot of different practices. Some countries are only offering boosters to to certain high risk populations and Atagi are looking at that data. Um, I don't know whether um, Ms Schofield or, or Ms Peasley would like to comment on the Atagi process. Um, thanks, Secretary. Um, Senator Lisa Schofield, First Assistant Secretary in the Hi. Vaccine Task Force. Um, so just to flag, Atagi's indicated that um, in the statement that they released at the end of last week, that they're expecting to be able to provide some advice in the next few weeks. Um, on that um, immunocompromised kind of cohort. Um, and then they've indicated that there would be um, some further advice on the need and timing for additional doses in the broader population um, towards the end of October. Okay. All right, well, we might, we'll have to engage with the target again. Is, does CITAG have a role here at all? Uh, no, CITAG, uh, 
has a role in uh, advising on the purchases of vaccines and treatments, uh, the actual programmatic implications are a target business. Okay. Um, all right. And I'll just see Senator Steele, John, I think might have gone. Oh, no, he's there. Senator Steele, John, can you just indicate whether you have questions? Further questions would be useful um, for me. Um, on, uh, can you just update me on AstraZeneca as well? We purchased 53.8 million doses. 3.8 came from overseas, 50 million to be manufactured here. What's happened um, under that contract? Are we still manufacturing up to 50 million doses? Ms Schofield, would you like to answer that? Um, yes. Um, yes, Senator, we are still manufacturing um, under that contract. Okay. And how, how much of that's been delivered? Um, I think the numbers that I have, and I will look to um, the general if I go astray, but um, doses delivered to date are 21 million doses of AstraZeneca and 19.4 of those have come from onshore manufacture and 1.6 million have come from off. Okay. So we still, we still um, getting some AstraZeneca from, expecting some from overseas. This was the stuff that was delayed earlier in the year. That's correct. Okay. So we're still expecting about half of that arrangement to come. Do you know when that will be coming? Um, no, we're in um, ongoing discussions with AstraZeneca around the time. Okay. Um, and then of that, of the 21 million, I think you've had, um, has how much of that has been gone overseas? I think I, I read some was going over to our um, Pacific countries or have you got an update on, on that? Yeah, I can, uh, Senator General Fruin. Thank you. The Coordinator General. So, so far we've sent uh, 3.242 million doses to the Pacific. Okay. And the government has committed to an initial uh, 20 million doses uh, into the Pacific. And we are working with DFAT to, to move uh, any available AstraZeneca that we can out to the Pacific. Okay, so the government's committed to 20 million, of which three point, basically three, three and a quarter million have been provided to date. Yes. Yep. Um, and do we have a timetable on the 20 million doses? Uh, the 20 million was, uh, I believe, by the middle of next year, and the government has since committed to an additional 20 million doses. Um, of mRNA across the calendar year next year. Sorry, I didn't just catch that, General Fruin. <laughs> the so the mask 20, muffle. 20 million, 20 million doses of AstraZeneca that we're working to have delivered by, uh, I'd say, the middle of next year. Right. And then the government has since committed to an additional 20 million doses of mRNA vaccines across uh, next calendar year. Okay. Um, and so are we utilising all of the AstraZeneca um, because in terms of either between the Pacific and local use, is it all being uh, used? Yeah, we're managing stockpiles at the moment. There is still, of course, uh, some people are still getting first dose AstraZeneca. There's a range of second dose AstraZenecas, uh, but wherever we can, we are moving uh, AstraZeneca to DFAT for, uh, for uh, on uh, sharing out into the Pacific. Okay, um, and Novavax. I, I know that I know that this probably also should have gone to the TGA. But Novavax, is there an update on that? Even whether still, yeah, Novavax is still uh, uh, saying that they will provide regulatory submission um, probably in quarter four, and that they will deliver the initial doses to Australia in quarter four. Okay, so you're not worried about Novavax. They assure us that uh, their production uh, s s systems are going well, um, that they are getting consistent production and they, they're pulling together that regulatory information. I think that the impressive thing about Notifax is that the, uh, the trial data shows that it's a very, very effective vaccine, possibly even potentially more effective than some of the vaccines we're using. So it could well be a very useful booster. Um, and they are confident that they will deliver. Yeah, okay. 
And at what point, so if you, if you don't have regulatory, um, the formal regulatory process now, and you're, we're virtually in quarter four, and you still expect them to deliver, at what point do you get worried about Novavax? Well, I think we, we, we continue to meet with Novavax on a regular basis. Ms Schofield and her team meet with them and I and, and the ministers met with them. Um, they, uh, the last time we met with them, they, they uh, indicated that they would be getting um, the regulatory data to us uh, early in quarter four, um, you know, presumably in October is what they're still claiming. And then the regulatory processes, I think Professor Skerritt has demonstrated the TGA can turn around a regulatory decision pretty quickly in the vaccine world. And so it may well be only a yeah. few weeks to, uh, to get that. And then we hopefully will get some uh, in at the, towards the middle or the, or the end of quarter four. But it, we have not counted on Novavax for our primary vaccine, vaccine strategy, as I think we've said on many occasions to this committee. We see it as a another redundancy potentially to be used for boosters or potentially to be, to be used uh, to help neighbours. So we will, we will determine its place uh, when, when we have it. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, the TGA, I mean, in previous things, have worked with companies in the lead up to a formal application process. So has that been happening for Novavax? That's, yes. I mean, that's been why they've been able to turn it around quickly. And yeah, yes, so Ms. Schofield's nodding. Yeah. Yes, they said that um, the TGA prevent, um, granted the provisional determination to Novavax um, back in January. So that's the expedited, like that pathway that um, that the other vaccine companies have worked through. So they've been engaged um, with Novavax um, all through the year. Okay. All right. Um, General Fruin, there was some media commentary about um, some. Um, reductions in Pfizer distribution during October to certain jurisdictions. Was there any truth in that? And um, if so, well, if not, just tell us that. And if so, can you explain what the issue was? Yeah, Senator, the, the issue was that we were, we'd been awaiting confirmation of our October allocations from Pfizer. This was mRNA specific issue. There was no issues with AstraZeneca or Moderna at that stage. Um, we wait month by month for confirmation from uh, Pfizer. Uh, Pfizer, uh, instead of providing us with a full month's allocation, provided us with the first two weeks of October. Um, it was related to some uh, global management issues that they have. Those amounts in the first two weeks were uh, less than what we had been forecasting. Um, we have no reason to believe that Pfizer won't make up the full amounts across the month of October, but. Uh, because of that, we had to make some adjustments within the program uh, to give the states and territories surety about their own planning across the first two weeks okay. of October. Uh, but no, uh, no jurisdiction received uh, less than what we had forecast in the first two weeks of October. We've since had the third week of October um, uh, confirmed, and I released the updated allocations document on Friday with the updated allocations to all the states and territories on. Uh, last Friday as well. So they're, they're, they're not um, getting reductions in Pfizer? There was, no. Is that what you're saying? Yep. Okay. Um, all right. And um, on, again, I'm, I'm trying to wrap this hearing up, which is why I'm jumping around a little bit. The um, Moderna, has that been approved? I know it's been approved by the TGA for use in uh, 12 to 17 year olds. So, yes. Um, has ATAGI approved it for use in 12 to 17 year olds? Because I haven't seen a specific statement from ATAGI on Moderna. I've seen their weekly updates. They refer to the TGA approval of Moderna, but when they approved Pfizer, they put out a statement. I haven't been able to find a similar one for Moderna. Um, uh, Senator, uh, it's, uh, it's what, what, that, what happened was that they revised their, their larger statement on vaccines more broadly, and Moderna is throughout all of that, including the 12 to 17 year olds. I think that was last week or the week before. Yeah, what, in just their weekly reason. update? 
No, no, in, the, in their full of vice uh, and, and a number of other other um, sort of related documents. But Hope, Hope Peasley or, or Lisa Schofield might, might talk to that, Hope. Mm. Uh, Hope Peasley, Assistant Secretary of oh. Medical Policy in Otagi Branch. Um, yes, Senator Gallagher, uh, Otagi has updated all of their clinical guidance in respect to the use of the Moderna vaccine, following on from the TGA's um, most recent registration. So that is now in we're missing you a bit there, Miss Peasley. I think she, she essentially uh, said what I said. So. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> again, is that online? Because I did look yesterday at length to find the specific approval for Moderna for 12 to 17 year olds from a target. It, yeah. Just whoever yes, updates is, that yeah. website, it is hard to navigate, can I say? <laughs> there are better. We'd be happy to. So we'll be happy to send it to you, Senator. Yeah, okay. Send you the link. All right. Yeah. But as far as you're um, so Moderna, I, I just hadn't had it confirmed. The Moderna is available and going into young people's arms as we speak. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's been yeah. going through uh, going through the pharmacies over the last fortnight now. Yeah. We've had more than uh, fifty four thousand four hundred doses of Moderna uh, put into people's arms as of yesterday. Um, and Dr. Detoka can update other aspects of Moderna through pharmacies if he has anything he wishes to add. Uh, no. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks. And um, I have a final question on what date, are you aware or do you know the date the international border will open and who makes that decision? Sorry, that's jumping around, I know. Is it, have you got a date <laughs> that so you are Senator, working towards? Uh, so, S Senator, that's obviously a decision for government, but it's been, it's been mentioned in, in the uh, advice that's come out of National Cabinet that that will be uh, later in the phases of the four-phase plan, but um, certainly starting in phase C. Yes, but I think ministers have been more specific than that. So are you working to a specific date? It's, it's related to the rollout of the vaccine, Senator. That's all of, all of the gateways to the different parts of the plan are related to the, to the, um, uh, to the 70 and 80%. Um, okay. So when ministers have uh, said that we'll have it open by the end of the year and people will be able to visit each other at Christmas, all that sort of stuff, that's that's them putting uh, a date rather than any date that you are working towards. So, Senator, I think in previous questions, the General Fruin has, has, has suggested uh, some indicative dates about when we might reach those targets, but they're indicative and they depend on people coming, rolling up their arms and so forth. But um, And the, the national plan, Senator, does require uh, both national achievement of those rates and achievement of those rates across each of the jurisdictions. So in the national rates that I have given you, there are some of the jurisdictions that will not reach the 70, 80% uh, yeah, date sure. till after that. Yeah, yeah. yeah so. Yeah. yeah, no, understood. Okay, um, we might um, finish there unless other senators have questions. No, no. Okay. Senator, oh. uh, Chair, if I, if yes. I may just... Yeah. But may I just um, slightly correct a, a statement I made earlier? It was pointed out to me that it might have been a little bit um, misleading. Um, this was in relation to, uh, I think it was Senator Patterson asked me about uh, intensive care admission rates for 70 to 79 year olds. So I just wanted to clarify that statement, if I may. Sure. Yeah. So um, uh, among, among COVID-19 cases in this age group, 4% of total cases were considered to be fully vaccinated. And among the cases in this age group admitted to ICU, 3% were fully vaccinated. So it was, I think I said 4% for both earlier, but that's, that's the, the actual data from earlier this week. Okay. And, and Senator uh, Tina Blewett here, Deputy Coordinator General, I just wanted to pick up on when Senator Keneally asked before about the misinformation and disinformation. Yep. While that is the Department of Home Affairs, I think it's important to note that the task force does have communication strategies. Uh, where we do work on, which is more focused on the hesitancy, but it's also about working with 
uh, particular groups, so core groups and community groups in terms of addressing any barriers and making sure that they are fully equipped and understanding um, around the uh, importance of vaccination and what it means for them. So I just wanted to put that thank on you. Uh, thank you very much. Can I um, really sincerely thank um, witnesses for appearing today for a longer session than normal. Uh, we do really appreciate it. Um, I thank you very much for attending, for giving evidence and not, you didn't take too many questions on notice so it won't add to the workload too much I hope uh, to those 83 that we're still looking out for but um, please note that answers to question on notice are to be provided by the 13th of October if possible. Um, thank you very much. The committee stands adjourned.